everybody. We are about to start the second book, The Vampire's Assistant. Now, if you're ready, let's begin. Chapter One. It was a dry, warm night, and Stanley Collins had decided to walk home after the scouts' meeting. It wasn't a long walk, less than two kilometers, and though the night was dark, he knew every step of the way as surely as he knew how to tie the rut. As surely as he knew how to tie a reef knot. Stanley was a scoutmaster. He loved the scouts. He'd been one when he was a boy and kept in contact when he grew up. He'd turned his three sons into first-rate scouts, and now that they'd grown up and left home, he was helping the local kids. Stanley walked quickly to keep warm. He was only wearing shorts and a t-shirt, and even though it was a nice night, his arms and legs were soon covered in goosebumps. He didn't mind. His wife would have a lovely cup of hot chocolate and currant buns waiting for him when he got home. He'd enjoy them all the more after a good brisk walk. Trees grew along trees grew along both sides of the road home, making it very dark and dangerous for anyone who wanted to who wasn't used to it. But Stanley had no fears. On the contrary, he loved the night. He enjoyed listening to the sound of his feet crunching through the long and grass and briars. Crunch, crunch, crunch. He smiled. When his sons were young, he'd pretend there were monsters lying in wait up in the trees as they walked home. He'd make scary noises and shake the leaves of low-hanging branches when the boys weren't looking. Sometimes they'd burst into screams and run for home at top speed, and Stanley would follow after them laughing. Crunch, crunch, crunch. If he was having trouble getting to sleep at night, he would imagine the sounds of his feet as they made their way home and that always helped him drift off into a happy dream. It was the nicest sound in the world as far as Stanley was concerned, better than all the music of Mozart and Beethoven. Crunch, 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 snap. Stanley stopped and frowned, and it sounded like a stick breaking. But how could it have been? He would have felt it if he'd stepped on a twig, and there were no cows or sheep in the nearby fields. He stood still for about half a minute, listening curiously. When there were no more sounds, he shook his head and smiled. It had been his imagination playing tricks. He'd tell the wife about it when he got home and they'd have a good laugh. He started walking again. Crunch, crunch, crunch. There, back to the familiar sounds. There was nobody else about. He would have heard more than a single branch snapping if there was. Nobody could creep up on Stanley J. Collins. He was a trained scoutmaster. His ears were as sharp as a fox's. Crunch, 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 crunch. Snap! He stopped again, the fingers of fear tightening around his beating heart. That hadn't been his imagination. He'd heard it, clear as a bell. A twig snapping somewhere overhead. And before it snapped... Had there been the slightest rustling sound? Is it something was moving? Stanley gazed at the trees, but it was too dark to see. There could have been a monster the size of a car up there, and he wouldn't have been able to spot it. Ten monsters, a hundred, a thou- Ah, oh, that was silly. There were no monsters in the trees. Monsters didn't exist. Monsters weren't real. It was a squirrel or an owl or something ordinary like that. Stanley raised a foot and began to bring it down. Snap! His foot hung in the air and his heart pounded quickly. That was no squirrel. The sound was too sharp. Something big was up there. Something that shouldn't be up there. Something that had never been there before. Something that... Snap! The sound was closer this time, lower down. And all of a sudden, Stanley could stand it no longer. He ran. Stanley was a large man, 
but fairly fit for his age. Still, it had been a long time since he'd run this fast, and after a hundred meters, he was out of breath and had a stitch in his side. He slowed to a halt and bent over, gasping for air. Crunch! His head shot up. Crunch, crunch, crunch. There were footsteps coming towards him, slow, heavy footsteps. He listened, terrified, as they came closer and closer. Had the monster leapt ahead of him through the trees? Had it climbed down? Was it coming to finish him off? Was crunch, crunch. The footsteps stopped, and Stanley was able to make out a figure. It was smaller than he expected, no bigger than a boy. He straightened up, gathered his courage about him like a cloak, and stepped forward for a better look. <laughs> it was a boy. A small, frightened-looking boy, dressed in a dirty suit. Stanley smiled and shook his head. <laughs> what a fool he'd been. The wife would have a field day when he told her about this. Are you okay, lad? Stanley asked. The boy didn't answer. Stanley didn't recognize the youngster, but a lot of new families had moved into the area recently. He no longer knew every child in the neighborhood. Can I help you? He asked. Are you lost? The boy shook his head slowly. There was something strange about him, something that made Stanley feel uneasy. It might have been the effect of the darkness and the shadows, but the boy looked very pale, very thin, very hungry. Are you all right? Stanley asked, stepping closer. Can I snap? The sound came from directly overhead, loud and menacing. The boy leapt back quickly out of the way. Stanley had just had time to glance up and spot a huge red shape, which might have been a bat, slashing its way down through the branches of the trees. And then the red monster was on him. Stanley opened his mouth to scream, but before he could, the monster's hands, claws, clamped over his mouth. There was a brief struggle. Then Stanley was sliding to the floor, unconscious, unseeing, unknowing. Above him, the two creatures of the night moved in for the feed. Chapter Two <laughs> Imagine a man his age wearing a scout's uniform, Mr. Krebsley snorted as he turned our victim over. Were you ever in the scouts? I asked. It did not have them in my day, he replied. He patted the man's meaty legs and grunted. <laughs> Plenty of blood in this one, he said. I watched as Mr. Krebsley searched, for the, searched the leg for a vein, then cut it open, a small slice, using one of his fingernails. As soon as blood oozed out, he clamped his mouth around the cut and sucked. He didn't believe in wasting any of the precious red mercury, as he sometimes called it. I stood uncertainly by his side as he drank. This was the third time I'd taken part in an attack, but I still wasn't used to the sight of the vampire sucking blood from a helpless human being. It had been almost two months since my death, but I was having a tough time adjusting to the change. It was hard to believe my old way of life was finished, that I was a half-vampire and could never go back. I knew I had to eventually leave my human side behind, but it was easier said than done. Mr. Crespley, Mr. Crespley lifted his head and licked his lips. Mmm, a good vintage, he joked, shuffling back from the body. Your turn, he said. I took forward, I took a step forward, then stopped and shook my head. I can't, I said. Do not be stupid, he growled. You've shied away twice already. It's time you drank. I can't, I cried. You have drunk animal blood, he said. That's different. This is a human. So what, Mr. Krebsley snapped. We are not. You have to start treating humans the same as animals, Darren. Vampires cannot live on animal blood alone. If you do not start drinking human blood, you will grow weak. If you continue to avoid it, you will die. I know, I said miserably. You've explained it to me. And I know we don't hurt those we drink from, not unless we drink too much, but... I shrugged unhappily. He sighed. <sighs> Very well. 
It is hard. Especially when you're only a hard vampire, the hunger is not so great. I will let you abstain this time. But you must feed soon. For your own sake. He returned to the cut and cleaned away the blood, which had been leaking out while we were talking from around the man's leg. Then he worked up a mouthful of spit and slowly let it dribble over the cut. He rubbed it in with a finger, then sat back and watched. The wound closed and healed. Within a minute, there was nothing left apart from a small scar that the man probably wouldn't notice when he awoke. That's how vampires protect themselves. Unlike in the movies, they don't kill people when they drink, not unless they're starving or get carried away and go too far. They drink in small doses, a bit here, a bit there. Sometimes they attack people out in the open, as we had just done. Other times, they creep into bedrooms late at night or into hospital wards or police cells. The people they drink from hardly ever know they've been fed on by a vampire. When this man woke, he would remember only a falling red shape. He wouldn't be able to explain why he'd passed out or what had happened to him while he was unconscious. If he found the scar, he'd be more likely to think it was the mark of aliens than a vampire. <laughs> aliens. Not many people know that vampires started the UFO stories. It was the perfect cover. People all over the world were waking up to find strange scars on their bodies and were blaming it on imaginary aliens. Mr. Krebsley had knocked the scoutmaster out with his breath. Vampires can breathe out a special kind of gas which makes people faint. When Mr. Krebsley wanted to send someone to sleep, he breathed into a cupped fist, then held his hand over the person's nose and mouth. Seconds later, they were out of the count and wouldn't wait for at least 20 or 30 minutes. Mr. Krebsley examined the scar and made sure it had healed correctly. He took good care of his victims. He seemed to be a nice man from what I've seen of him, apart from the fact that he was a vampire. Come, he said, standing. The night is still young. We will go find a rabbit or a fox for you. You don't mind me not drinking from him? I asked. Mr. Krebsley shook his head. You will drink eventually, he said, when you are hungry enough. No, I said silently behind him as he turned and walked away. I won't. Not from a human. I'll never drink from a human. Never. Chapter three. I woke early in the afternoon as usual. I'd gone to bed shortly before dawn, the same time as Mr. Krebsley. But while he had to stay asleep until night fell again, I was, I was free to rise and move about in the daylight world. It was one of the advantages of being only a half vampire. I fixed a late breakfast of marmalade on toast. Even vampires have to eat normal food. Blood alone won't keep us going and settled down in front of the hotel television. Mr. Krebsley didn't like hotels. He usually slept out in the open, in an old barn or in a ruined building or a large crypt. But I was having none of that. I told him straight up after a week of sleeping rough that I had enough of it. He grumbled a bit, but gave away in the end. The last two months had passed very quickly because I'd been so busy learning about being a vampire's assistant. Mr. Krebsley wasn't a good teacher and didn't like repeating himself so I had to pay attention and learn fast. I was very strong now. I could lift enormous weights and crush marbles to pieces with my fingers. If I shook hands with a human, I had to take care not to break the bones in their fingers. I could do chin-ups all night long and could throw a metal ball further than any grown-up. I measured my throw one day, then checked in a book and discovered I'd set a new world record. I was excited at first, but then realized I couldn't tell anybody about it. Still, it was nice to know I was a world champion. My fingernails were really thick, and the only way I could shorten them was with my teeth. Clippers and scissors were no good on my new, tough nails. They were a nuisance. I kept ripping my clothes when I was putting them on or taking them off and digging holes in my pockets when I stuck my hands in. We covered a lot of distance since that night in the, in the cemetery. First, we fled at top of vampire speed. Me on Mr. Krebsley's back, invisible to human eyes, gliding across the land like a couple of high-speed ghosts. That's called flitting. But flitting is tiring work, so after a couple of nights, we began taking trains and buses. 
I don't know where Mr. Crutchley got the money for our travel and hotels and food. He had no wallet that I could see, and no bank cards, but every time he had to pay for something, out came the cash. I hadn't grown fangs. I'd been expecting them to sprout, and I'd been checking my teeth in the mirror every night for three weeks before Mr. Crutchley caught me. What are you doing? he asked. Looking for fangs, I told him. He stared at me for a few seconds, then burst out laughing. <laughs> we do not grow fangs, you ass! He roared. But then how do we bite people? I asked, confused. We do not, he told me, still laughing. We cut them with our nails and suck the blood out. We only use our teeth in emergencies. So I won't grow fangs. No, your teeth will be harder than any humans, and you will be able to, to bite through skin and bone if you wish, but it is messy. Only stupid vampires use their teeth, and stupid vampires tend to not last very long. They get hunted down and killed. I was a bit disappointed to hear that. It was one of the things I liked most about those old vampire movies. The vampires looked so cool when they bared their fangs. But... After some thought, I decided it was better off without the fangs. The fingernails making holes in my clothes were bad enough. I would have been in real trouble if my teeth had grown and I'd started cutting chunks out of my cheeks as well. Most of the old vampire stories were untrue. We couldn't change shape or fly. Crosses and holy water didn't hurt us. All garlic did was give us bad breath. Our reflections could be seen in mirrors and we do cast shadows. Some of the myths were true though. A vampire couldn't be photographed or filmed with a video camera. There's something odd about vampire atoms, which means that all that comes out on film is a dark blur. I could still be photographed, but you wouldn't get a clear photo of me no matter how good the light. Vampires were friendly with rats and bats. We couldn't turn into them, as some books and films claimed, but they did like us. They knew from the smell of our blood that we were different to humans and often cuddled up to us while we were sleeping or came around looking for scraps of food. Dogs and cats, for some reason, hated us. Sunlight would kill a vampire, but not very quickly. A vampire could walk about during the day if he wrapped himself up in lots of clothes. He'd tan quickly and start to go red within a quarter of an hour. Four or five hours of sunlight would kill him. A stake through the heart would kill us, of course, but so would a well-placed bullet, or a knife, or electricity. We could drown, or be crushed to death, or catch certain diseases. We were tougher to kill than normal people, but we weren't indestructible. There was more I had to learn. Loads more. Mr. Krebsley said it would be years before I knew everything, and was able to get along by myself. He said a half-vampire who didn't know what he was doing would be dead within a couple of months. So I had to stick with him like glue, even if I didn't want to. When the toast and marmalade were finished, I sat and bit my nails for a few hours. There wasn't anything good on TV, but I didn't want to go outside, not without Mr. Krebsley. We were in a small town, and people made me nervous. I kept expecting them to see through me, to know where I was and come after me with stakes. When night fell, Mr. Krebsley emerged and rubbed his belly. I am starving, he said. I know it is early, but let us head out now. I should have taken more of that silly scout man's blood. I think I will track down another human. He looked at me with one raised eyebrow. Maybe you will join me this time. Maybe, I said, though I know I wouldn't. It was the one thing I'd sworn I would never do. I might have to drink the blood of animals to stay alive, but I would never feast on one of my own kind, no matter what Mr. Crutchley said or how much of my belly rumbled. I was a half vampire, yes, but I was also a half human, and the thought of attacking a living person filled me with horror and disgust. Chapter Four Blood Mr. Crepsley spent much of his time teaching me about blood, it's vital to vampires. Without it, we grow weak and old and die. Blood keeps us young. 
Vampires age at a tenth of the human rate. For every 10 years that pass, vampires only age one. But without human blood, we age even quicker than humans, maybe 20 or 30 years in the space of a year or two. As a half vampire, who aged at a fifth of the human race, I didn't have to drink as much human blood as Mr. Krebsley, but I would have to drink some to live. <clears throat> the blood of animals, dogs, cows, sheep, keeps vampires ticking over, but there are some animals that they, we, can't drink from. Cats, for instance. If a vampire drinks a cat's blood, he might as well pour poison down his throat. We also can't drink from monkeys, frogs, most fish, and snakes. Mr. Crapsley hadn't told me the names of all the dangerous animals. There were loads, and it would take time to learn which was safe and which weren't. His advice was to always ask before I tried something new. Vampires had to feed on humans once a month or so. Most feasted once a week. That way, they didn't have to take much blood. If you only fed once a month, you had to drink a lot of blood in one go. Mr. Krebsley said it was too dangerous to go too long without drinking. He said the thirst can make you drink more than you meant to, and you were likely to end up killing the person you drank from. A vampire who sups frequently can control himself, he said. One who drinks only when he must will end up sucking wildly. The hunger inside us must be fed to be controlled. Fresh blood was best. If you drank from a living human, the blood was full of goodness, and you didn't need to take very much. But blood began to go sour when a person died. If you drank from a dead body, you had to drink a lot more. The general rule is, never drink from a person who has been dead more than a day, Mr. Krebsley explained. How will I know how long a person has been dead? I asked. The taste of the blood, he said. You will learn to tell good blood from bad. Bad blood is like sour milk, only worse. Is drinking blood, blood dangerous? I asked. Yes, it will sicken you. Maybe turn you mad or even kill you. Ugh. We could bottle fresh blood and keep, it, and keep it for as long as we liked for use in emergencies. Mr. Crabsley had several bottles of blood stored in his cloak. He sometimes had one with a meal as if it was a small bottle of wine. Could you survive on bottled blood alone? I asked one night. For a while, he said, but not in the long term. How do you bottle it? I asked curiously, examining one of the glass bottles. It was like a test tube, only the glass was slightly darker and thicker. It is tricky, he said. I will show you how it is done the next time I'm filling up. Blood. It was what I needed most, but also what I'd feared most. If I drank a human's blood, there was no going back. I'd be a vampire for life. If I avoided it, I might become a human again. Perhaps the vampire blood in my veins would wear out. Maybe I wouldn't die. Maybe only the vampire in me would die and then I could return home to my family and friends. It wasn't much of a hope. Mr. Krebsley has said it was impossible to become human again, and I believed him. But it was the only dream I had to cling to. Chapter 5 Days and nights passed, and we moved on. We wandered from towns to villages to cities. I wasn't getting on very well with Mr. Krebsley. Nice as he was, I couldn't forget that he was the one who pumped vampire blood into my veins and made it impossible for me to stay with my family. I hated him. Sometimes during the day, I think about driving a stake through his heart while he was sleeping and hitting off on my own. I might have too, except I knew I couldn't survive without him. For the moment, I needed Lars and Krebsley. But when the day came that I could look after myself, I was in charge of Madame Opta. I had to find food for her and exercise her and clean out her cage. I didn't want to. I hated the spider almost as much as I hated the vampire. But Mr. Krebsley said I was the one who'd stolen her so I could look after her. I practiced a few tricks with her every now and then, but my heart wasn't in it. 
She didn't interest me anymore, and as the weeks passed by, I played with her less and less. The one good thing about being on the road was being able to visit loads of places I hadn't been before. Seeing all sorts of sights. I love traveling, but since we travel at night, I didn't get to see much of our surroundings. One day, while Mr. Crepsley was sleeping, I got tired of being indoors. I left a note on TV in case I wasn't back when he woke, then set off. I had very little money and no idea where I would go, but that didn't matter. Just getting out of the hotel and spending some time by myself was wonderful. It was a large town, but fairly quiet. I checked out a few toy stores and played some free computer games in them. I'd never been very good on computers before, but with my new reflexes and skills, I was able to do pretty much anything I wanted. I raced through levels of speed games, knocked out every opponent in martial arts tournament, and zapped all the aliens from the skies and sci-fi adventures. After that, I toured the town. There were plenty of fountains and statues and parks and museums, all of which I examined with interest. But going around the museums reminded me of Mum. She loved talk she loved taking me to museums, and that upset me. I always felt lonely and miserable when I thought of Mum, Dad, or Annie. I spotted a group of boys my age playing hockey on a tarmac quad. There were eight players on each side. Most had plastic sticks, though a few had wooden ones. They were using an old white tennis ball as a puck. I stopped to watch, and after a few minutes, one of the boys came to size me up. Where are you from? he asked. Out of town, I said. I'm staying at a hotel with my father. I hated calling Mr. Krebsley that, but it was the safest thing to say. He's from our town, the boy called back to his mates, who had stopped playing. Is he part of the Adams family? One of them shouted, and they all laughed. What's that supposed to mean? I asked, offended. Have you looked at yourself in the mirror lately? The boy said. I glanced down at my dusty suit and knew what they were laughing. I looked like something out of Oliver Twist. I lost the bag with my normal clothes, I lied. These are all I have. I'm getting new stuff soon. You'd want to, the boy smiled, then asked if I could play hockey. When I said I could, he invited me to play with them. You can be on my team, he said, handing me a spare stick. We're six two down. My name's Michael. Darren, I said in reply, testing the stick. I rolled up the legs of my trousers and checked my laces were tied properly. While I was doing that, the opposition scored another goal. Michael cursed loudly and dragged the ball back to the centre. You want to help touch off? He asked me. Sure. Well, come on then, he said, tapped the ball to me and moved ahead, waiting for me to pass back. <clears throat> it had been a long time since I played hockey at school in PE. We usually have to choose between hockey and football and I never passed up a chance for a game of footy. But with the stick in my hands and the ball in my feet, it seemed like only yesterday. I knocked the ball from left to right a few times, making sure I hadn't forgotten how to control it, then looked up and focused on the goal. There were seven players between me and the goalkeeper. None of them rushed to tackle me. I guess they felt there was no need being five goals up. I set off. A big kid, the other team's captain, tried blocking me, but I slipped around him easily. I was past another two before they could react, then dribbled around a fourth, the fifth player slid in with a stick at knee level, but I jumped over him with ease, dummied the sixth and shot before the seventh, and final defender could get in the way. Even though I hit the ball quite softly, it went much harder than the goalie was expecting and flew into the top right-hand corner of the goal. It bounced off the wall, and I caught it in the air. I turned, smiling, and looked back at my teammates. They were still in their own half, staring at me in shock. I carried the ball back to the halfway line, and set it down without saying a word. Then I turned to Michael and said, 7-3. He blinked slowly and smiled. <laughs> oh, yes! He chortled softly, then winked at his teammate. I think we're going to enjoy this. I had a great time for a while, controlling the course of the play, rushing back to defend, picking players out with pinpoint passes. I scored a couple of goals and set up four more. We were leading 9-7 and coasting. The other team hated it 
and made and had and it made us give them two of our best players, but it made no difference. I could have given them everybody except our goalkeeper and still knocked the stuffing out of them. Then things got nasty. The captain of the other team, Danny, had been trying to foul me for ages, but I was too quick for him and danced around his raised stick and stuck out legs. But then he began to push my ribs and stand on my toes and slam his elbows into my arms. None of it hurt me, but it annoyed me. I hate sore losers. The crunch came when Danny pinched me in a very painful place. Even vampires have their limits. I gave a roar and crouched down, wincing from the pain. Danny laughed and sped away with the ball. I rose after a few seconds, mad as hell. Danny was halfway down the pitch. I set off after him. I brushed the players between us aside. It didn't matter if they were on his team or mine. Then slid in behind them and swiped at his legs with my stick. It would have been a dangerous tackle if it had come from a human. But coming from a half vampire... There was a sharp snapping sound. Danny screamed and went down. Play stopped immediately. Everybody in the quad knew the difference between a yell of pain and a scream of real agony. I got to my feet, already sorry for what I'd done, wishing I could take it back. I looked at my stick, hoping to find it broken in two, hoping that had been what made the snapping noise. But it wasn't. I'd broken both of Danny's shin bones. His lower legs were bent awkwardly, and the skin around the shins was torn. I could see the white of bone in amongst the red. Michael bent to examine Danny's legs. When he rose, there was a horrified look in his eyes. You've cracked his legs wide open, he gasped. I didn't mean to, I cried. He, he squeezed my... I pointed to the spot beneath my waist. You broke his legs, Michael shouted, then backed away from me. Those around him backed away as well. They were afraid of me. Sighing, I dropped my stick and left, knowing I'd make matters worse if I'd stayed and waited for grown-ups to arrive. None of the boys tried to stop me. They were too scared. They were terrified of me. Darren Shan, a monster. Chapter 6 It was dark when I got back. Mr. Crapsley was up. I told him we should skip town straight away, but didn't tell him why. He took one look at my face, nodded, and started gathering our belongings. We said little that night. I was thinking how rotten it was to be a half-vampire. Mr. Crapsley sensed there was something wrong with me, but he didn't bother me with questions. It wasn't the first time I'd been sulky. He was getting used to my mood swings. We'd found an abandoned church to sleep in. Mr. Crepsley lay out on a long pew while I made a bed for myself in a pile of moss and weeds on the floor. I woke early and spent the day exploring the church and the small cemetery outside. The headstones were old and many cracked or covered with weeds. I spent several hours cleaning a patch of them, pulling weeds away and washing the stones with water I had fetched from a nearby stream. I kept my mind off the hockey game. A family of rabbits lived in a nearby, nearby burrow. As the day went by, they crept closer to see what I was up to. They were curious little fellows, especially the young ones. At one point, I pretended to be asleep and a couple edged closer and closer until they were only half a meter away. When they were as close as they were likely to get, I leapt up and shouted, BOOM! and they went running away like wildfire. One fell head over heels and rolled away down the mouth of its burrow. That cheered me up greatly. I found a shop in the afternoon and bought some meat and veg. I set a fire when I returned to the church, then fetched the pots and pans from, then, put, then fetched the pots and pans bag from beneath Mr. Krebsley's pew. I searched among the contents until I found what I was looking for. It was a small, tin-shaped pot. I carefully laid it upside down on the floor, then pressed the metal bulge on the top. The tin mushroomed out in, in size, 
as folded in panels opened up. Within five seconds, it had become a full sized pot, which I filled with water and stuck on the fire. All the pots and pans in the bag were like this. Mr. Krebsley got them from a woman called Ivana long ago. They weighed the same as ordinary cookware, but because they could fold up small, they were easier to carry around. I made a stew, as Mr. Krebsley had taught me. He believed everybody should know how to cook. I took leftover bits of the carrots and cabbage outside and dropped them by the rabbit burrow. Mr. Krebsley was surprised to find dinner. Well, it was breakfast from his point of view, waiting for him when he awoke. He sniffed the fumes from the bubbling pot and licked his lips. <laughs> I could get used to this, he smiled, then yawned, stretched, and ran his hand through a short crop of orange hair on his head. Then he stretched the then he scratched the long scar running down the left side of his face. It was a familiar routine of his. I'd often wanted to ask how he got his scar, but I never had. One night, when I was feeling brave, I would. There were no tables, so we ate off our laps. I got two of the folded up plates out of the bag, popped them open, and fetched the knives and forks. I served up the food, and we tucked in. Towards the end, Mr. Krebsley wiped around his mouth with a silk napkin and coughed awkwardly. Mm. It is very nice, he complimented me. Thank you, I replied. I, um, that is... He sighed. <sighs> I was never very good at being subtle, he said. So I will come right out and say it. What went wrong yesterday? Why were you so upset? I stared at my almost empty plate, not sure if I wanted to answer or not. Then, all of a sudden, I blurted out the whole story. I hardly took a breath between the start and finish. Mr. Krebsley listened carefully. When I was done, he thought about it for a minute or two before speaking. It is something you must get used to, he said. It is a fact of life that we are stronger than humans, faster and tougher. If you play with them, they will get hurt. I didn't mean to hurt him, I said. It was an accident. Mr. Krebsley shrugged. Listen, Darren, there is no way you can stop this happening again. Not if you mix with humans. No matter how, no matter how hard you try to be normal, you are not. There will always be accidents waiting to happen. So what you're saying is I can't have friends anymore, right? I nodded sadly. I figured that out by myself. That's why I was so sad. I've been getting used to the idea of never being able to go back home to see my old friends, but it was only yesterday that I realized I'd never be able to make new ones either. I'm stuck with you. I can't have any other friends, can I? He rubbed the scar and pursued it and pursed his lips. That is not true, he said. You can't have friends. You just have to be careful. You... That's not good enough, I cried. You said it yourself. There will always be accidents waiting to happen. Even shaking hands is dangerous. I could cut their wrists open with my nails. I shook my head slowly. No, I said firmly. I won't put people's lives in danger. I'm too dangerous to have friends anymore. Besides, it's not like I can make a true friend. Why not? He asked. Because true friends don't keep secrets from one another. I could never tell a human that I was a vampire. I'd always have to lie and pretend to be someone I'm not. I'd always be afraid that he'd find out what I was and hate me. It is a problem every vampire shares, Mr. Krebsley said. But every vampire isn't a child, I shouted. What age were you when you were changed? Were you a man? He nodded. Friends aren't that important to adults. My dad told me that grown-ups get used to not having loads of friends. They have work and hobbies and other stuff to keep them busy. But my friends were the most important thing in my life, apart from my family. Well, you took my family away when you pumped your stinking blood into me. Now you've ruined the chances of my ever having a proper friend again. Thanks a lot. Said angrily. 
Thanks for making me a monster out of me and wrecking my life. I was so close to tears, but I didn't want to cry. Not in front of him. So I stabbed at the last piece of meat on my plate with my fork and rammed it into my mouth, where it chewed upon it fiercely. Mr. Krebsley was quiet after my outburst. I couldn't tell if he was angry or sorry. For a while, I thought I'd said too much. What if he'd turned around and said, if that is the way you feel, I will leave you. What would I do then? I was thinking of apologizing when he spoke in a soft voice and surprised me. I am sorry, he said. I should not have blotted you. It was a poor call. You were too young. It has been so long since I was a boy, I had forgotten what it was like. I never thought of your friends and how much you would miss them. It was wrong of me to blood you. Terribly wrong. I... He trailed off into silence. He looked so miserable, I almost felt sorry for him. Then I remember what he'd done to me, and I hated him again. Then I saw wet drops at the corners of his eyes, which might have been tears, and felt sorry for him once more. I was very confused. Well, there's no use moaning about it, I finally said. We can't go back. What's done is done, right? Yes, he sighed. If I could, I would take back my terrible gift. But that is not possible. Vampirism is forever. Once somebody has been changed, there is no changing back. Still, he said, mulling it over. It is not as bad as you think. Perhaps... His eyes narrowed thoughtfully. Perhaps what? I asked. We can find friends for you, he said. You do not have to be stuck with me all the time. I don't understand, I frowned. Didn't we just agree it was safe for me? Didn't we just agree it wasn't safe for me to be around humans? I'm not talking about humans, he said, starting to smile. I'm talking about people with special powers. People like us. People you can tell your secrets to. He leant across and took my hands in his. Darren, he said. What do you think about going back and becoming a member of the Sik du Freak? Chapter 7 The more we discussed the idea, the more I liked it. Mr. Krebsley said the Sikh performers would know who I was and would accept me as one of their own. The lineup of the show often changed, and there was nearly always someone who could be around my own age. I'd be able to hang out with them. What if I don't like it there? I asked. Then we leave, he said. I enjoyed traveling with the Sikh, but I am not crazy about it. If you like it, we stay. If you do not, we hit the road again. Then you won't mind me tagging along? I, they won't mind me tagging along? I asked. You will have to pull your weight, he replied. Mr. Tall insists on everybody doing something. You will have to help set up chairs and lights, sell souvenirs, clean up afterwards, or do the cooking. You will be kept busy, but they will not overwork you. We will have plenty of time for our lessons. We decided to give it a go. At least it would mean a proper bed every night. My back was stiff from sleeping on floors. Mr. Krebsley had to find out where the show was before we could set off. I asked him who was going to do that. He told me he was able to home in on Mr. Tall's thoughts. You mean... He's telepathic, I asked, remembering what Steve had called people who could talk to each other using only their brains. Uh, sort of, 
Mr. Crepsley said. We cannot speak to each other with our thoughts, but I can pick up his aura, you could call it. Once I locate that, tracking him down will be no problem. Could I locate his aura? I wanted to know. No, Mr. Crepsley said. Most vampires, along with a few gifted humans, can, but half vampires cannot. He sat down in the middle of the church and closed his eyes. He was quiet for about a minute. Then his eyelids opened and he stood. Got him, he said. So soon, I asked. I thought it would take longer. I have searched for his aura many times, Mr. Krebsley explained. I know what to look for. Finding him isn't as easy as finding him is as easy as finding a needle in a haystack. That's supposed to be hard, isn't it? Not for a vampire, he grunted. While we were packing to leave, I found myself gazing around the church. Something had been bothering me, but I wasn't sure whether I should mention it to Mr. Krebsley or not. Go on, he said, startling me. Ask whatever it is that is on your mind. How did you know I wanted to ask something? I gulped. He laughed. <laughs> It does not take a vampire to know when a child is curious. You've been bursting with a question for ages. What is it? I took a deep breath. Do you believe in God? I asked. Mr. Krebsley looked at me oddly, then nodded slowly. I believe in the gods of the vampires. I frowned. There are vampire gods. Of course, he said. Every race has gods. Egyptians, the Indians, the Chinese. Vampires are no different. What about heaven? I asked. We believe in paradise. It lies beyond the stars. When we die, if we have lived good lives, our spirits float free of the earth to traverse the stars and the galaxies and come at last to a wonderful world at the other side of the universe. Paradise. <sighs> and if they don't live good lives? They stay here, he said. They remain bound to the earth as ghosts, doomed to wander the face of this planet forever. I thought about that. What's a good life for a vampire? I asked. How do they make it to paradise? Live cleanly, he said. Do not kill unless necessary. Do not hurt people. Do not spoil the world. So drinking blood isn't evil, I asked. Not unless you kill the person you drink from, Mr. Krebsley said. And even then, sometimes, it can be a good thing. Killing someone can be good, I gasped. Mr. Krebsley nodded seriously. People have souls, Darren. When they die, those souls go to heaven or paradise but it is possible to keep a part of them here. When we drink small amounts of blood, we do not take any of a person's essence, but if we drink lots, we keep part of them alive within us. How? I asked, frowning. By draining a person's blood, we absorb some of that person's memories and feelings, he said. They become part of us, and we can see the world the way they saw it, and remember things which might have otherwise been forgotten. Like what? He thought a moment. One of my dearest friends is called Paris Skyle, he said. He is very old. Many centuries ago, he was friends with William Shakespeare. The William Shakespeare? The guy who wrote the plays? Mr. Krebsley nodded. Plays and poems, but not all of them. But not all of Shakespeare's poetry was recorded. Some of his most famous verses were lost. When Shakespeare was dying, Paris drank from him. Shakespeare asked him to, and was able to tap into those lost poems and have them written down. The world would have been a poorer place without them. But I stopped. Do you only do that with people who ask and who are dying? Yes, he said. It would be evil to kill a healthy person, 
but to drink from friends who are close to death and keep their memories and experiences alive. He smiled. That is very good indeed. Come, he said then. Brood about it on the way. We must be off. I hopped on Mr. Crutley's back when we were ready to leave, and off we flitted. He still hasn't explained how he could move so fast. It wasn't that he ran quickly, it was more like the world slipped by as he ran. He said all four vampires could flit. It was nice, watching the countryside drift away behind us. We ran up hills and across vast plains, faster than the wind. There was complete silence while we were flitting, and nobody ever noticed us. It was as if we were being surrounded by a magic bubble. While we flitted, I thought about what Mr. Crepsley had said about keeping people's memories alive by drinking from them. I wasn't sure how that would work, and made up my mind to ask him more about it at a later date. Flitting was hard work. The vampire was sweating, and I could see him starting to struggle. To help, I took out a bottle of human blood, uncorked it, and held it to his lips so he could drink. He nodded his silent thanks, wiped the sweat from his brow, and continued. Finally, as the sky was beginning to lighten, he slowed to a halt. I hopped down off his back and looked around. We were in the middle of a country road, fields and trees all around us, not a house to be seen. Where's the Cirque du Freak? I asked. A few kilometers further ahead, he said, pointing. He was kneeling down, panting for breath. Did you run out of steam? I asked, unable to keep the giggles out of my voice. No, he glared. I could have made it, but I did not want to arrive looking flushed. You better not rest too long, I warned him. Morning's on its way. I know precisely what time it is, he snapped. I know more about mornings and dawns than any living human. We have plenty of time on our side. A whole 43 minutes left. If you say so. I do. He stood, annoyed, and began to walk. I waited until he was a bit in front, then ran ahead of him. Hurry up, old man, I jeered. You're getting left behind. Keep it up, he growled. See what it gets you. A clip around the ear and a boot up the pants. He started trotting after a couple of minutes, and the two of us jogged along side by side. I was in good spirits, happier than I'd been for months. It was nice having something to look forward to. We passed a ragged bunch of campers on the way. They were starting to wake up and move around. A couple waved to us. They were funny looking people, long hair, strange clothes, weighed down with fancy earrings and bracelets. There were banners and flags all over the camp. I tried reading them, but it was hard to focus while I was jogging and didn't want to stop. From what I could gather, the campus had something to do with a protest against the new bypass. The road was very curvy. After the fifth bend, we finally spotted the Cirque du Freak, nestled in a clearing by the banks of a river. It was quiet. Everyone was sleeping, I imagined. And, we, and if we'd been in a car and not looking for the vans and tents, it would have been easy to miss. It was an odd place for the circus to be. There was no hall or big tent for the freaks to perform in. I figured this must be a resting point between two towns. Mr. Crepsley weaved between the vans and cars with confidence. He knew exactly where he was going. I followed, less than sure of myself, remembering the night I crept past the freaks and stole Madame Octa. Mr. Crepsley stopped at a long silver van and knocked on the door. It opened almost immediately, and the towering figure of Mr. Tall was revealed. His eyes looked darker than ever in the dim light. If I hadn't known any better, I could have sworn he had no eyeballs, only two black, empty spaces. Oh, it's you, he said, voice low, lips hardly moving. I thought I felt you searching for me. He craned over Mr. Krebsley and looked down to where I was shaking. I see you've brought the boy. May we come in? Mr. Krebsley asked. Of course. What is it one is supposed to say to you, vampires? He smiled. Enter of your own free will. Something like that, 
Mr. Crepsley replied, and from the smile on his face, I knew it was an old joke between them. We entered the van and sat. It was pretty bare inside, just a few shelves with posters and leaflets from the circ. The tall red hat and gloves I had seen him wear before were a couple of knickknacks from a fold-away bed. I didn't expect you back so soon, Larton, Mr. Tall said. Even when he was sitting down, he looked enormous. The swift return had not been on the agenda, Hibernius. Hibernius? That was a strange name. Still, it suited him somehow. Hibernius Tall. It had an odd ring to it. Did you run into trouble? Mr. Tall asked. No, Mr. Krebsley said. Darren was not happy. I decided he would be better off here, among those of his own kind. I see. Mr. Tall studied me curiously. You have come a long way since I saw you last, Darren Shan, he said. I preferred it where I was, I grumbled. Then why did you leave? he asked. I glared at him. You know why, I said coldly. He nodded slowly. Is it okay if we stay? Mr. Krebsley asked. Of course, Mr. Toll replied immediately. Delighted to have you back, actually. We're a bit understaffed at the moment. Alexander Ribs, Simon Searsa, and Goethe Teeth are off on holidays or business. Cormac Limbs is on his way to join us, but is late getting here. Larden Krebsley and his amazing performing spider will be an invaluable addition to the lineup. Thank you. Mr. Krebsley said. What about me? I asked boldly. Mr. Tor smiled. You are less valuable, he said, but welcome all the same. I snorted, but said nothing. Where shall we be playing? Mr. Krebsley asked next. Right here, Mr. Tor told him. Here? I piped up in surprise. That puzzles you? Mr. Tall inquired. Well, it's in the middle of nowhere, I said. I thought you only played in towns and cities where you get big audiences. We always get a big audience, Mr. Tall said. No matter where we play, people will come. Usually we stick to more populated areas, but this is a slow time of the year for us. As I've said, Several of our best performers are absent, as are certain other members of our company. A strange secretive look passed between Mr. Tall and Mr. Krebsley, so I felt like I was being left out of something. So we are resting for a while, Mr. Tall went on. We shall not be putting off any shows for a few days. We're relaxing. We passed a road camp. We passed a road camp on our way, Mr. Krebsley said. Are they causing any problems? The foot soldiers have NOP, Mr. Toll laughed. They're too busy defending trees and rocks to interfere with us. What's an OP? I asked. Nature's opposing protectors, Mr. Toll explained. They're eco-warriors. They run around the country trying to stop new roads and bridges being built. They've been here a couple of months, but I do to move on soon. Eco warriors, I, I asked. Are they real warriors? Do they have guns and grenades and tanks? The two adults almost laughed their heads off. <laughs> he can be quite silly sometimes, Mr. Krebsley said between fits of laughter. But he is not as dumb as he seems. I felt my face reddening, but I held my tongue. I knew from experience that it's no use getting mad at grown-ups when they laugh at you. It only makes them laugh even harder. They call themselves warriors, Mr. Tall said. But they are not really. They chain themselves to trees and pour sand into the engines of JCBs and toss nails into the path of cars. That sort of thing. Why? I started. But Mr. Krebsley interrupted. We do not have time for questions, he said. A few more minutes and the sun will be up. He rose, 
and shook Mr. Toll's hand. Thank you for having us back, Hibernius. My pleasure, Mr. Toll replied. I trust you took good care of my coffin. Of course. Mr. Krebsley smiled happily and rubbed his hands together. That is what I miss most when I am away. It will be nice. It'll be nice to bed down in it once more. What about the boy? Mr. Toll asked. Do you want us to knock together a coffin for him? Don't even think about it, I shouted. You won't get me in one of those again. I remember what it felt like to be in a coffin when I was buried alive and shivered. Mr. Krebsley smiled. Put Darren in with one of the other performers, he said. Somebody his own age, if possible. Mr. Tall thought a moment. How about Evra? Mr. Krebsley's smile spread. Yes, I think putting him in with Evra is a marvellous idea. Who's Evra? I asked nervously. You will find out, Mr. Krebsley promised, opening the door to the van. I will leave you to Mr. Tall. He will take care of you. I have to be away. And then he was gone off to find his beloved coffin. I glanced over my shoulder and found Mr. Tall standing directly behind me. I don't know how he crossed the room so quickly. I didn't even hear him moving to stand up. Shall we go? He said. I gulped and nodded. He led the way through the campsite. The morning was breaking and I saw a couple of lights coming on in a few of the uh, caravans and tents. <clears throat> Mr. Tall led me to an old grey tent, big enough for five or six people. Here are some blankets, he said, handing over a bunch of woolly sheets. And a pillow. I don't know where he got them from. He hadn't had them when we left the van, but, it was, but I was too tired to ask. You may sleep as late as you wish. I will come for you when you are awake and explain your duties. Evra will take care of you until then. I lifted the flap of the tent and looked inside. It was too dark to see anything. Who's Evra? I asked, turning back to Mr. Tall. But he was gone, having disappeared with his usual rapid, silent speed. I sighed and entered, clutching the blanket to my chest. I let the flap fall back into place, then stood quietly inside, waiting for my eyes to adjust. I could hear someone breathing softly, and can make out a vague, sh a vague shape in the hammock in, a, in the darkness beyond the middle of the tent. I looked for somewhere to make my bed. I didn't want my tent mate tripping over me when he was getting up. I walked forward a few blind steps. Suddenly, something slithered towards me through the darkness. I stopped and stared ahead, wishing desperately that I could see. Without the light of the stars or moon, even a vampire struggles to make things out. Hello? I called softly. Are you Evra? I'm Darren Shen. I'm your new... I stopped. The slithering noise had reached my feet. As I stood, rooted to the spot, something fleshy and slimy wrapped itself around my legs. I instantly knew what it was, but I didn't dare look down until it had climbed more than halfway up my body. Finally, as it coiled, as its coils curled around my chest... I worked up the courage to lower my eyes and lock gazes with that of a long, thick, hissing snake. Chapter 8 I stood frozen with fear for more than an hour staring into the snake's deathly cold eyes, waiting for it to strike. Finally, with the light of the strong morning sun shining through the canvas of the tent, the sleeping shape in the hammock shifted, yawned, sat up, and looked around. It was the snake boy, and he got a shock when he saw me. He rocked back in the hammock and raised the covers as though to protect himself. Then he saw the snake wrapped around me. And I breathed e and breathed easily. Who are you? He said. He asked sharply. 
What are you doing here? I shook my head slowly. I didn't dare speak in case the movements of my lungs caused the snake to strike. You better answer, he warned, or I'll tell her to take your eyes out. Uh, I, uh, um, uh, D D Darren Shen, I stuttered. Mr. Toll told me to uh, c come in. He said I was to be your new r roommate. Darren Shen, the snake boy frowned, then pointed knowingly. You're Mr. Krebsley's assistant, aren't you? Yes, I said quietly. The snake boy grinned. <laughs> Do you know Mr. Tall was putting you in with me? I nodded, and he laughed. <laughs> I've never yet met a vampire without a nasty sense of humor. He swung down out of the hammock, crossed the tent, took hold of the snake's head, and began unwrapping it. You're okay, he assured me. In fact, you are never in any danger. The snake's been asleep the whole time. You could have tucked her off and she wouldn't have stirred. She's a deep sleeper. She's asleep? I squeaked. But how come she wrapped herself around me? He smiled. She sleep crawls. Sleep crawls? I stared at him. Then the snake, which hadn't moved it while he was unwinding her. The last of her calls came free, and I was able to step away to one side. My legs, my legs were stiff and full of pins and needles. <laughs> the sleep crawling snake. I laughed easily. I laughed uneasily. <laughs> Good job she's not a sleep eating snake. The snake boy tucked his pet away in the corner and stroked her hair lovingly. She wouldn't have eaten you even if she had woken up, he informed me. She ate a goat yesterday. Snakes, snakes as eyes don't have to eat very often. Leaving a snake, he threw back the tent flap and stepped out. I followed quickly, not wanting to be left alone with a reptile. I studied him closely outside. He was exactly as I remembered. A few years older than me, very thin, with long yellow-green hair, narrow eyes, strangely wet fingers and toes. His body was covered in scales of green, gold, yellow, and blue. He was wearing a pair of shorts and nothing else. Oh, by the way, he said, my name's Evra Ron. He held, out a, he held out a hand as we shook. His palm felt slippery, but dry. A few of the scales came off and stuck to my hand when I pulled it away. They were like scraps of colored dead skin. Evra Von what? I asked. Just plain Von, he said, rubbing his stomach. You hungry? Yes, I said, and went with Evra to get something to eat. The camp was alive with activity. Since there had been no show the night before, most of the freaks and their helpers had gone to bed early and so were up about earlier than usual. I was fascinated by the hustle and bustle. I hadn't realized there were so many people working for the circ. I thought it would just be the performers and assistants I'd seen the night I was went to the show with Steve. But as I looked around and saw that those were just the tip of the iceberg, there were at least two dozen people walking or talking, washing or cooking, none of whom I'd seen before. Who are all these? I asked. The backbone of the Cirque du Freak, Ever replied. They do the driving, set up the tents, the laundry, the cooking, mend our costumes, clear up after shows. It's a big operation. Are they all normal humans? I asked. Most of them, he said. How do they come to work here? Some are related to the performers. Some are friends of Mr. Tall. Some just wander in, like like what they saw, and stayed. People can do that? I asked. If Mr. Tall likes the look of them, Everett said. There are always vacancies at the Cirque du Freak. Everett stopped at a large campfire, and I stopped beside him. Hans Hans, a man who could walk on his hands and run faster on them than, he, than the world's fastest sprinter, was resting on a log, while Truska, the bearded lady who grew her beer whenever she wanted, cooked sausages on a wooden stick. 
Several humans were sitting or lying about. Morning greetings, everyone, Hans Hans said. How do, Hans? Ever replied. Who is your young friend? Hans asked, eyeing me suspiciously. <clears throat> this is Darren Shan, Ever said. The Darren Shan? Hans asked, eyebrows raising. None other, Ever grinned. What do you mean, the Darren Shan? I asked. <laughs> You're famous around these parts, Hans said. Why? Because I'm a... I lowered my voice. A vampire? Hans laughed pleasantly. <laughs> half vampires are nothing new. If I had a gold coin for every, vam for every half vampire I'd seen, I'd have... He's He scrunched up his face and thought. Uh... 29 gold coins, but young half-vampires are a different matter. I never saw or heard a boy your age living in up amongst the ranks of the walking dead. Tell me, have the vampire generals been around to inspect you yet? Who are the vampire generals? I asked. They're... Hans! A lady washing clothes barked. He stopped speaking and looked around guiltily. Do you think Larson would enjoy hearing people... Hearing you spread tales, she snapped. Hans pulled a face. Sorry, he said. It's the fresh morning air. I'm not used to it. Makes me say things I shouldn't. I wanted him to explain about the vampire generals, but it would have been impolite to ask. Truska checked the sausages, pulled a couple off the stick, and handed them out. She smiled when she came to me and said something in a strange foreign language. Ever laughed. She wants to know if you like sausages or if you're a vegetarian. <laughs> There's a good one, Hans chuckled. A vampire vegetarian. You speak her language? I asked Evra. Yes, he said proudly. I'm still learning. It's the hardest language I've ever tried to learn. But I'm the only one in the camp who knows what she's saying. I'm excellent in her languages, he boasted. What language is it? I asked. I don't know, he said, frowning. She won't tell me. That sounded odd, but I didn't want to say anything to offend him. Instead, I took one of the sausages and smiled my thanks. I bit into it and had to let go straight away. It was roasting hot. Ever laughed and handed me a mug of water. I drank it until my mouth was back to normal, then blew on the sausage to cool it down. We sat with Hans and Truska and the others for a while, chatting and eating and soaking up the morning sun. The grass was damp with dew, but none of us minded. Ever introduced me to everyone in the group. There were too many names for me to memorize in one go, so I just smiled, shook hands, and filed the faces away. Mr. Tall appeared before long. One moment he wasn't there, the next he was standing behind Ever, warming his hands over the fire. You're up early, Master Shan, Mr. Tall remarked. I couldn't sleep, I told him. I was too... I looked over at Ever and smiled. Wound up. I hope it will not affect your ability to work, Mr. Tor said. I'll be fine, I said. I'm ready and able. You're sure? I'm sure. That's what I like to hear. He produced a large notebook and flipped through the pages. Let's see what we can find for you to do today, he mused. Tell me, are you a good cook? I can cook a stew. Mr. Krebsley taught me. Have you ever cooked for a company of 30 or 40? No. Hmm. Too bad. Maybe you'll learn. He flicked through another couple of pages. Can you sew and stitch? No. Have you washed clothes before? By hand? Yes. No. Mm -mm. He flicked on some more, then snapped the book shut. Okay, he said. Until we find a more permanent position for you, stick with Evra and help him with his chores. Does that sound fair? I like that, I said. You don't mind, Evra? 
he asked the snake boy. Not at all, Ever Ever replied. Very well. It's settled. Ever will be in charge of you until further notice. Do what he says. When your colleague in blood arises, he met Mr. Krebsley. You're free to spend the night with him if he so desires. We'll see how you get on, then make a decision on how best to utilize your talents. Thank you, I said. My pleasure, he replied. I expected him to vanish in the blink of an eye, but instead he turned and walked away slowly, whistling, enjoying the sunshine. Well, Darren, Ever said, sticking a scaly arm around my shoulders. Looks like you and me are partners now. How do you feel about that? I feel good, partner. Excellent. He clapped my shoulder and gulped down the last of his sausage. Then let's get busy. What do we do first? I asked. What would we be doing first every morning? Ever said, setting off. Milking the poison from the fangs of my snake. Oh. I said, coming to a halt. Is that dangerous? Only if she bites before we finish, Ever said, then laughed at my expression and pushed ahead of him to onto the tent. Excuse me while I get more water. <clears throat> Chapter 9 Ever did the milking himself, to my great relief, then dragged the snake outside and laid her on the grass. We fetched buckets of water and scrubbed her down with very soft sponges. After that, we had to feed the wolf man. His cage was near the back of the campsite. He roared when he saw us coming. He looked as angry and dangerous as he had that night I visited the Sikh with Steve. He shook his bars and swiped at us if we got too close, which we didn't. Why is he so vicious? I asked, tossing him a large chunk of raw meat, which he grabbed in midair and bit into. Because he's a real wolf man, Ever said. He's not just somebody very hairy, he's half human, half wolf. Isn't it cruel to keep him chained up? I asked, throwing him another slice of meat. If we didn't, he'd run riot and kill people. The mix of human and wolf blood has driven him mad. He wouldn't just kill when he was hungry. If he was free, he'd murder all the time. Isn't there a cure? I asked, feeling sorry for him. There isn't a cure, because it isn't a disease, Ever explained. This isn't something he caught, it's how he was born. This is why he is. How did it happen? I asked. Ever looked at me seriously. Do you really want to know? I stared at the hairy beast in the cage, ripping up the meat as if it was candy floss, then gulped and said, No, I suppose I don't. <clears throat> we handled a variety of jobs after that. We peeled potatoes for that night's dinner, helped prepare a tire on one of the cars, spent an hour painting the roof of a van, and walked a dog. Everest said most days were like this, just wandering through the camp, seeing what he needed to be doing, helping out as helping out as and when required. In the evening, we took a load of cans and broken bits of glass to the tent of Rama's two bellies, a huge man who could eat anything. I wanted to stay and watch him eat, but Ever hurried me out. Ramus didn't like watching Ramus didn't like what people watching him eat in private. We had a lot of time to ourselves, 
And during our quieter moments, we told each other about our lives, where we'd come from, and how we'd grown up. Ever had been born to ordinary parents. They'd been horrified when they saw him. They abandoned him in an orphanage, where he stayed until a nasty circus owner bought him at the age of four. Those were bad days, he said quietly. He used to beat me and treat me like a real snake. He kept me locked up in a glass cage and let people pay to look and laugh at me. He'd been with the circus for seven long, miserable years, touring small towns, being made to feel ugly and freakish and useless. Finally, Mr. Tall came to the rescue. He turned up one night, Ever said. He appeared suddenly, out of the darkness, and stood by my cage for a long time, watching me. He didn't say a word, and neither did I. The circus owner came. He didn't know who Mr. Tall was, but he thought he might be a rich man interested in buying me. He stated his price and stood back, waiting for an answer. Mr. Tall didn't say anything for a few minutes. Then his left hand grabbed the circus owner by the neck. He squeezed once, and that was the end of him. He fell to the floor, dead. Mr. Tall opened the door to my cage and said, Let's go, Evra. I think Mr. Tall was able to read minds, which is how he knew my name. Evra was quiet after that. He had a faraway look in his eyes. Do you want to see something amazing? He said eventually, snapping out of his thoughtful mood. Sure, I said. He turned to face me, then stuck out his tongue and pushed it up over his lips and right off his nose. Ew, gross! I yelled delightedly. He pulled the tongue back and grinned. I've got the longest tongue in the world, he said. If my nose was big enough, I could poke my tongue all the way up to the top, down my throat, and back on my mouth again. You couldn't, I laughed. <laughs> Probably not, he giggled. But it's still pretty impressive. He ran the tongue out again, and this time licked around his nostrils, one after the other. It was revolting, but hilarious. Oh, that's the most disgusting thing I've ever seen, I laughed. I bet you wish you could do it, Everett said. I wouldn't even if I could, I lied. Don't you get snot all over your tongue? I don't have any snot, Everett said. What? No snot? It's true, he said. My nose is different to yours. There's no snot or dirt or hairs. My nostrils are the cleanest part of my whole body. What does it taste like? I asked. Lick my snake's belly and you'll find out, he replied. It's the same taste as that. I laughed and said I wasn't that interested. Later, when Mr. Krebsley asked me what I'd done all day, I, re I simply replied, I made a friend. Chapter 10 We've been with the Sikh two days and nights. I spent my days with Evra, helping him, and my nights with Mr. Krebsley, learning about vampires. I was going to bed earlier than I had been, though. I rarely hit the sack before one or two in the morning. I'd struck up a, I'd struck up a strong friendship with Evra. He was older than me, but he was shy, probably because of his troubled past, so we were pretty well suited. As the third day rolled by, I found myself gazing around the small groups of vans and cars and tents, feeling like I'd been part of the scene for years. I was starting to suffer from the effects of going so long without drinking human blood. I wasn't as strong as I had been, and I couldn't move as quickly as I could before. My eyesight had dulled, as had my hearing and sense of smell. I was much stronger and quicker than I'd been as a human, but I, couldn't but I could feel my powers slipping a bit more every day. I didn't mind. I'd rather lose some strength than drink from a human. I was relaxing with Evra on the edge of a campsite that afternoon when we spotted a figure in the bushes. Who's that? I asked. A kid from a nearby village, 
Everest said. I've seen him hanging around before. I watched the boy in the bushes. He was trying hard not to be seen, but to a person with my powers, fading though they were, he was as obvious as an elephant. I was curious to know what he was doing, so I turned to Ever and said, Let's have some fun. What are you planning? he asked. Lean in and I'll tell you. I whispered my plan in his ear. He grinned and nodded, then stood and pretended to yawn. I'll be off, Darren, he said. See you later. See you, Evra, I replied loudly. I waited until he was gone, then stood and walked back to the camp by myself. When I was out of sight of the boy in the bushes, I doubled back, using the caravan's intents to mask my movements. I walked about a hundred meters to the left, then crept forward until I was level with the boy and snicked towards him. I stopped ten meters away. I was a little bit behind him, so he couldn't see me. His eyes were still glued to the camp. I looked over his head and saw Evra, who was even closer than I was. He made an OK sign with his thumb and index finger. I crouched down low and moaned. Oh, I groaned. Ooh. The boy stiffened and looked over his shoulder nervously. He wasn't able to see me. Who's there? He asked. <laughs> Ever grunted on the other side of him. The boy's head spun around in the other direction. Who's there? He shouted. Oh. Oh, 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 I snorted in the manner of a gorilla. I'm not afraid, the boy said, edging backwards. You're just playing a nasty trick. <coughs> Everest screeched. I shook a branch. Everett rattled a bush. Then I tossed a stone into the area just ahead of the boy. His head was spinning around like a puppet, darting all over the place. He didn't know whether it would be safer to run or stay. Look, I don't know who you are, he began, but I'm... Everett had sneaked up behind him, and now, as the boy spoke, stuck out his extra long tongue and ran it over the boy's neck, making a hissing snake noise. That was enough for the boy. He screamed and ran for his life. Ever and me ran after him, laughing our socks off, making noises all the time. He fled through thorn bushes and nettles as though they weren't there, screaming for help. We grew tired of the game after a few minutes and might have let him get away, but then he tripped and went sprawling into a patch of very high grass. We stood, trying to spot him amongst the grass, but there was no sign of him. Where is he? I asked. I can't see him, Ever, Ever said. Do you think he's all right? I don't know. Everett looked worried. He might have fallen down a big hole or something. Kid? I shouted. Are you okay? No answer. There's no need to be afraid. We won't hurt you. We were only fooling. We didn't... There was a rushing noise behind us. And then I felt a hand on my back, shoving me forward into the grass. Everett fell with me, and when we sat up, spluttering with shock, we heard somebody laughing behind us. We turned slowly, and there was the kid, bent over, double with laughter. <laughs> fooled you, fooled you, he sang, dancing about. I saw you coming from the beginning. I was only pretending to be frightened. I ambushed you. <laughs> he was making fun of us, and though we felt pretty foolish, when we stood and looked at each other, we burst out laughing. He led us into a patch of grass filled with sticky green seeds, and we were covered in them head to toe. You look like a walking plant, I joked. You look like the jolly green giant, Ever replied. Both of you look stupid, the boy said. We stared at him, and his smile faded a bit. What do you do? he grumbled. I suppose you think this is funny, I snarled. He nodded silently. Well, I got news for you, kid. I said, stepping closer. 
putting on the meanest face I could. I paused menacingly and then burst into a smile. It is! He laughed happily, relieved that we could see the funny side. Then stuck out his hands, one to either of us. Hi, he said as we shook. My name's Sam Grest. Pleased to meet you. Hi, Sam Grest, I said as I shook his hand and thought to myself. <clears throat> Hi, Sam Grest, I said, and as I shook his hand, I thought to myself, looks like this is friend number two. And he did become my friend. But by the time the safety freak moved on, I was wishing with all my heart that I'd never even heard his name. Chapter 11 Sam lived about a kilometre away with his mum and dad, two younger brothers and a baby sister, three dogs, five cats, two budgies, a turtle and a tank full of tropical fish. It's like living in Noah's Ark, he laughed. I try and stay out of the house as much as possible. Mum and dad don't mind. They think children should be free to express their individuality. As long as they turn up for bed at night, they're happy. They don't even care if I miss school every once in a while. They think school is a despotic system of indoctrination designed to crush the spirit and stamp out creativity. Sam talked like that all the time. He was younger than me, but you wouldn't have known it by listening to him speak. So you two guys are with the show? He asked, rolling a piece of pickled onion around his mouth. He loved pickled onions and carried a small plastic jar of them with him. We'd returned to the spot at the edge of the clearing. Era was lying in the grass. I was sitting on a low-hanging branch, and Sam was climbing the tree above me. What sort of show is it? He asked before he could, before he could answer his first question. There are very few markings in the bands. At first I thought you were a traveler. Then after observing for a while, I decided you must be performers of one sort of another. We're masters of the macabre, Evra said. Agents of mutations, lords of the surreal. He was speaking like that to show that he could match Sam's fancy way with the language. I wish I could have spouted a few grand sounding sentences, but I've never been good with words. So it's a magic show, Sam asked excitedly. It's a freak show, I said. A freak show? His jaw dropped open and a bit of pickled onion fell out. I had to move quickly to dodge it. Two idiot men and anomalies are such as that? Uh, sort of, I said. But our performers are magical, wonderful artists, not just people who look different. Cool, he glanced at Evra. Of course, I could see from the start that you were dermatology dermatologically challenged. He was talking about every skin. I looked up the word in a dictionary later. But I had no idea there might be other members like you among your company. He looked over towards the camp, eyes alight with curiosity. This is most fascinating, he sighed. What other bizarre examples of the human form do your numbers, do your numbers hoard? If you mean what other sort of performers are there, the answer is loads, I told him. We have a bearded lady, of course. And a wolf man, Ever said. Oh, and a man with two bellies, I added. We went through the entire list, Ever mentioning some I'd never seen. The lineup of the Cirque de Frigue often changed. Performers came and went, depending on when the show was playing. Sam was greatly impressed, and for the first time since we'd met, I had nothing to say. He listened silently, eyes wide. Soaking on one of his, sucking on one of his pickled onions, shaking his head very so off, every so often he could, as though he couldn't believe what he was hearing. It's incredible, he said softly when we finished. You must be the luckiest kids on the planet, living with real circus freaks, traveling the world, privy to solemn and magnificent secrets. What well, I wouldn't give to trade places with you. I smiled to myself. I don't think he'd have liked to trade places with me, not if he knew my full story. Hey, 
he said, a thought striking him. I don't suppose I could... I don't suppose you could swing it for me to join. I'm a hard worker. Right as a button. Used to responsibility. I'll be an asset. Could I join? As an assistant? Please? Ever and me smiled at each other. I don't think so, Sam. Ever said. We don't take on many kids. If you were older, or if your parents waited, wanted to, or if your parents wanted to join, that would be different. But they wouldn't mind, Sam insisted. They'd be delighted for me. They're always saying travel broadens the mind. They love the idea of me going around the world, having adventures, seeing marvelous mystical sights. Ever shook his head. Sorry, maybe when you're older. Sam pouted and kicked some of the leaves off a nearby branch. They floated down over me, and, and a couple stuck in my hair. It's not fair, Sam grumbled. People always say, when you're older. Where would the world be if Alexander the Great had waited until he was older? And how about Joan of Arc? If she'd waited until he was... Uh, until if she'd waited until she was older, the English might have conquered and colonized France. Who decides when someone's old enough to make decisions for themselves? It should be down to the individual. He ranted on for a while longer, complaining about adults and the corrupt, bloody system. And about the time being ripe for, and about the time being ripe for a children's revolution. It was like listening to a crazy politician on television. If a child wants to open a chocolate factory, let him open one, Sam stormed. If he wants to become a jockey, fine. If he wants to be an explorer and set off a strange cannibal populated islands, okay. We're the slaves of the modern generation. We're... Sam, Ever interrupted. Do you want to come see my snake? Sam broke out into a smile. Do I? He yelled. I thought you'd never ask. Come on, let's go. Leaving down out of the tree. He set down. He set off for the campsite at top speed. Speech is forgotten. We followed slowly, laughing gently, feeling much older and wiser than we were. Chapter Twelve. Sam thought the snake was the coolest thing he had ever seen. He wasn't a bit scared, and didn't hesitate to wrap her around her neck like a scarf. He asked all sorts of questions. How long was she? What did she eat? How often did she shed her skin? Where was she from? What, what type of snake was she? How fast could she move? Ever answered all of Sam's questions. He was a snake expert. There wasn't a thing he didn't know about the Serpent Kingdom. He was even able to tell Sam roughly how many scales the snake had. We gave Sam a, t a guided tour of the campsite after that. We took him to see the wolfman. Sam was very quiet in the shade of the hairy wolfman's van, frightened by the snarling creature within. We introduced him to Hans' hands. Then we chanced upon Rama's two bellies practicing his act. Ever asked if we could watch and, and Rama's lettuce. Sam's eyes almost popped out of his head when he saw Rama's chew a cup into tiny pieces swallow it, piece it back together inside of his belly, and bring it out of his throat and out of his mouth. I was going to fetch Madame Octa and show Sam some of the tricks I could do with her, but I didn't feel too hot. The lack of human blood in my diet was getting to me. My belly often grumbled hungrily, no matter how much food I ate, and I sometimes got sick, and I had to sit down suddenly. I didn't want to faint or get sick with a spider out of her cage. I knew from experience how deadly she could be if you lost control of her for even a couple of seconds. Sam would have stayed forever, but it was getting dark, and I knew Mr. Krebsley would be waking soon. Ever and me had jobs to do, so we told him it was time he went home. Can't I stay a while longer? he pleaded. Your dinner will be ready, Ever said. I can eat with you, Sam said. There isn't enough food, I lied. Well, I'm not very hungry anyway, Sam said. It's amazing how filling pickled onions can be. Maybe he could stay. Ever amused, I stared at him, surprised, but he winked to show he was only pretending. Could I? Sam asked, delighted. 
Sure, Avery said. But you'll have to help us with our jobs. I'll do anything, Sam said. I don't mind. What is it? The wolf man needs feeding and washing and brushing, Avery said. Sam's smile slipped. The wolf man? He asked nervously. Oh, it's no problem, Everett told him. He's normally quiet once he's been fed. He hardly ever bites if it... <clears throat> he hardly ever bites his helpers. If he does attack, keep your head clear of his mouth and stick an arm down his throat. It's better to lose an arm than your... You know, Sam said quickly, I think I do have to go home. Mum said something about friends coming over tonight. Oh, that's a pity, Ever grinned. Sam backed away, gazing in the direction of the wolf man's cage. He looked sad to be going, so I called for him to stop. Uh, what are you doing tomorrow? I asked. Nothing, he said. Do you want to come over in the afternoon and hang out with us? You bet, Sam whooped, then paused. I won't have to help feed and clean the, uh... He gulped loudly. No, Ever said, still smiling. Then I'll be there. See you tomorrow, guys. See you, Sam, we said together. He waved, turned, and departed. Sam's nice, isn't he? I said to Ever. I got a kid, Ever agreed. He could do with not trying to sound so smart all the time, and he's a bit of a scaredy cat, but otherwise, there's nothing wrong with him. Do you think you'd fit in if you did join the show? I asked. Ever snorted. <laughs> like a mouse in a house full of cats. What do you mean? I asked. This life isn't for everyone. A few weeks away from his family, having to, f having to clean out toilets and cook for 30 or 40 people, he'd be running screaming for the hills. We all manage all right, I said. We're different, Ever said. We're not like other people. This is what we're cut out for. Everybody has a place where they belong. This is ours. We're meant to... He stopped and began to frown. He was glancing over my head at something in the distance. I turned to see what was bothering him. For a few seconds, I couldn't make out anything. But then, some way off, coming through the trees to the east, I glimpsed the flickering light of a burning torch. How could that be? I asked. I'm not sure. Ever said. We watched for a few minutes as the torch came closer. I saw figures moving beneath the cover of the trees. I couldn't tell how many there were, but it had to be at least six or seven. Then, as they broke free of the trees, I saw who they were, and goosebumps sprang to life across my neck and arms. The walkers were the small, blue-hooded people that Steve and me had seen the night of the show, the ones who helped sell sweets and toys to the crowd, and assisted with the act. I'd forgotten about those strange blue-headed helpers. It had been several months since that night, and I had other things in my mind. They came out of the woods in pairs, one set after the other. I counted twelve in all, though there was a thirteenth member, a taller person, walking behind the rest. He was the one shining the torch. Where did they come from? I asked Ever quietly. I don't know. He answered. They left the show a few weeks ago. I have no idea where they went. They kept to themselves, mostly. And who are they? I asked. They're... He began to answer, but stopped all of a sudden. His eyes widened with fear. It was the man bringing up the rear, the thirteenth taller member of the group, visible now that he was closer, who had scared Everett. The blue-hooded people passed by silently. As the mysterious 13th person approached, I noticed he was dressed differently to the others. He wasn't very tall, he just looked big in comparison to the blue hoods. He had short white hair, a thick pair of glasses, a sharp yellow suit, and long green Wellington boots. He was quite plump and walked with a peculiar little waddle. He smiled pleasantly at us as he passed. A smile back, but Everett was rooted to the spot, 
unable to move the muscles of his mouth. The Blue Hoods and the man with the torch walked further into the campsite, all the way to the back, where they found a large, clear spot. There, the Blue Hoods began putting up a tent. They must have been carrying the materials beneath their cloaks, while the larger man headed for Mr. Toll's van. I studied Evera. He was shaking all over, and though his face could never turn white because of its natural color, it was paler than it had been ever before. What's wrong? I asked. He shook his head silently, unable to reply. What is it? Why are you so frightened? Who was that man? He... It... Ever cleared his throat and took a deep breath. When he spoke, it was in a low, trembling voice, filled with sheer, blood-chilled terror. <clears throat> that was Mr. Tiny, he said, and I could get no more out of him for ages after that. Chapter 13 Every sphere faded as the evening wore on, but he was very slow to return to normal and was uncommonly edgy the whole night long. I had to take his knife from him and do his share when he was peeling potatoes for the dinner. I was afraid he might slice one of his fingers off. After we'd eaten and helped washed up, I asked Evera about the mysterious Mr. Tiny. We were in the tent and Evera was playing with a snake. He didn't reply immediately, and for a while I thought he wasn't going to. But in the end, he sighed and began to speak. Mr. Tiny is the leader of the little people, he said. The small guys in the blue hooded cloaks, I asked. Yes, he calls them the little people. He's their boss. He doesn't come here often. It's been almost two years since I last saw him, but he gives me the creeps when he does. He's the spookiest man I've ever met. You looked all right to me, I said. That's what I thought the first time I saw him, Ever agreed. But wait until you've spoken to him. It's hard to explain, but every time he looks at me, I feel like he's planning to slaughter, skin, and roast me. He eats people? I asked, aghast. I don't know, Ever said. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't, but you get the feeling he wants to eat you. And it's not just me being silly. I've discussed it with the other members of the Sikh, and they feel the same way. Nobody likes him. Even Mr. Tall gets fidgety when Mr. Tiny's around. Well, the little people must like him, mustn't they? I asked. They follow and obey him, don't they? Maybe they're scared of him, Everett said. Maybe he forces them to obey him. Perhaps they're slaves. Have you ever asked them? They don't talk, Everett said. I don't know if it's because they can't or prefer not to, but nobody in the circus has ever been able to get a word out of them. They're very helpful and they'll do whatever you ask, but they're as silent as walking dummies. Have you ever seen their faces? I asked. Once, Everett said. Normally they don't let their hoods slip, but one day I was helping one of them move a heavy machine. It fell on one of the little people and crushed him. He didn't make a sound even though I must have been in a huge amount of pain. His hood fell to the side, and I caught a glimpse of his face. It was horrible, Ever said quietly, stroking his, snake slough, stroking his snake softly. Full of scars and stitches and crumpled in on itself, as though some giant had squeezed it with his claws. It had no ears or nose, and there was some sort of mask over its mouth. His skin was grey and dead looking, and his eyes were like two green balls near the top of his face, and he had no hair. Everett shivered at the memory. I felt cold myself, thinking about his description. What happened to him? I asked. Did he die? I don't know, Everett said. A couple of his brothers, I always think of him as brothers, though they probably aren't, turned up and carted him away. You never saw him again. They all looked the same, Everett said. Some were a bit smaller or taller than the rest, 
but there's no real way of telling them apart. Believe me, I tried. Stranger and stranger. I was really interested in Mr. Tiny and his little people. I always liked mysteries. Perhaps I could solve this one. Maybe, with my vampire powers, I could find a way to talk with one of the hooded creatures. Where do the little people come from? I asked. Nobody knows, Ever said. There's usually four or six of them with the sick. Sometimes more turn up by themselves. Sometimes Mr. Tiny brings new ones in. It was odd that none were here when you arrived. You think it had something to do with me and Mr. Krebsley coming? I asked. I doubt it, Ever said. It was probably just coincidence. Or fate. He paused. Which is another thing. Mr. Tiny's first name is Desmond. So? He tells people to call him Des. So? I asked again. Put it together with his surname, Everett told me. I did. Mr. Des Tiny. Mr. Des Tiny. Mr. Mr. Destiny. I, uh, I whispered. And Ever nodded seriously. I was bursting with curiosity and asked Ever many more questions, but his answers were limited. He knew almost nothing of Mr. Tiny and only slightly more of the little people. They ate meat, they smelled funny, they moved slowly most of the time, they either didn't feel pain or couldn't show it, and they had no sense of humor. How do you know that? I asked. Bradley Stretch, Ever answered darkly. He used to be with the show. He had rubbery bones and could make his arms and legs stretch. He wasn't very nice. He was constantly playing practical jokes on us and had a nasty way of laughing. He didn't just make you look like a fool. He made you feel like one too. We played a show in an Arabian palace. It was a private show for a sheik. He enjoyed all the acts, but especially liked Bradley's. The two got chatting, and Bradley told the sheik he couldn't wear jewelry because it always slipped off or burst because of the changing, because of the changing shape of his body. The sheik hurried away and came back with a small gold bracelet. He gave it to Bradley and told him to put it on his wrist. He did, and when the sheik told him to try shaking it off, well. Bradley made his arm small and big, short and long, but he couldn't shake that bracelet loose. The sheik said it was magic and could only be removed if the wearer wanted to take it off. It was very valuable, priceless, but he made Bradley a gift of it to show his appreciation. Getting back to the little people, Ever said. Bradley loved to tease them. He was always finding new ways to trick them. He fixed traps to hang them up in by the air on the feet. He set their cloaks on fire. He squirted washing up liquid on ropes they were using to make their hands slip or glue to make them stick. He put thumbtacks in their food. He made their tent collapse. He locked them into a van. Why was he so mean? I asked. I think because they never reacted, Ever said. He liked to see people get upset but the little people never cried or screamed or f lashed out. They seemed to take no notice of his pranks. At least, everybody thought they took no notice. Ever made a funny noise that was a half laugh or a half a moan. One morning, we woke up and Bradley had disappeared. Nowhere to be found. We searched for him, but when he didn't turn up, we moved on. We weren't worried. Performers join and leave the CX pretty much as they please. It wasn't the first time when it sneaked away in the middle of the night. I thought no more about it until a week or so later. Mr. Tiny had been to see us the day before and taken all but two of the little people with him. Mr. Tall told me I had to help the remaining pair with the duties. I tidied around their tent and rolled out their hammocks. They all sleep in hammocks. That's where I got mine from. Did I mention that before? He hadn't, but I wouldn't want to sidetrack him, so I said nothing. After that, he went on, I gave that pot a wash. 
It was a big black pot set on a fire in the middle of the tent. The place must have been full of smoke whenever they cooked, and the pot was covered in grime. I took it outside and emptied the remains of their last few meals, scraps of meat and bits of bone, onto the grass. I scrubbed it thoroughly, then took it back inside. Next, I decided to gather up the bits of meat in the grass and throw them to the wolfman. Waste not, want not, as Mr. Tall often says. As I was gathering up the meat and bone, I noticed something glistening. Everett turned away and rooted through the bag underneath his hammock. When he faced me, he was holding a small gold bracelet. He let my eyes linger on it, then slipped it on his left hand. He shook his arm as fast as he could, but the bracelet never budged. When he stopped shaking his arm, he slipped the bracelet off with his fingers of his right hand and tossed it to me. I caught and examined it, but I didn't put it on. The bracelet that the sheet gave to Bradley Stretch, I guessed. The very same, Everett said. I handed it back. I don't know whether it was because of something especially bad he did, Everett said, fingering the bracelet. Or if they were just tired of the non-stop teasing. What I do know is ever since I've gone out of my way to be polite to the small silent people in the dark blue cloaks. What did you do with the remains of, I mean, with the scraps of meat? I asked. Did you bury them? Heck no, Everett said. I fed them to the wolf man as I meant to. Then, in response to my horrified gasp, he said, Waste not, want not, remember? I stared at him in silence, then began to laugh. Everett chuckled too. In a minute, we were rolling about on the floor, hugging our sides. <laughs> we shouldn't laugh, I gasped. Poor Bradley Stretch, we should be crying. I'm laughing too hard to cry, Everett giggled. I wonder what he tasted like. I don't know, Everett said, but I bet it was rubbery. That made us laugh so much, tears rolled from our eyes and trickled down our cheeks. It was a terrible thing to laugh at, but we couldn't help ourselves. In the middle of our fit of laughter, the flap to the door of, the, of our tent was poked aside by an inquisitive head, and Hunt's hands entered. What's the joke? He asked, but we couldn't tell him. We tried, but every time I started, I began laughing again. He shook his head and smiled at our foolishness. Then, when we quieted down, he told us why he was here. I have a message for you two, he said. Mr. Tall wants you to report to his van as soon as possible. What's up, Hans? Ever asked. He was still giggling. Why does he want us? He doesn't, Hans said. Mr. Tiny is with him. He's the one who wants you. Our laughter stopped instantly. Hans let himself out without any further words. Mr. T -t Tiny wants us. Ever gasped. I heard, I said. What do you think he wants? I don't know, Ever stuttered, though I could see what was going through his mind. It was the same thing that was rushing through mine. We were thinking of the little people, Bradley Stretch, and a big black pot full of scraps of human meat and bone. Chapter 14 Mr. Tall, Mr. Krebsley, and Mr. Tiny were in the van when we entered. Everett was shaking like a leaf, but I wasn't especially nervous. Mind you, when I saw the worried looks of Mr. Tall and Mr. Krebsley and realized how uneasy they were, it set me on edge a little. Come in, boys, Mr. Tiny welcomed us, as though it was his van and not Mr. Tall's. Sit down, make yourselves at home. I'll stand if it's all the same, Everett said, trying not to let us hear the chatter of his teeth. I'll stand too, I said, following Everett's lead. As you please, Mr. Tiny said. He was the only one sitting. I've been hearing a lot about you, young Darren Shan, Mr. Tiny said. He was rolling something between his hands, a heart-shaped watch. 
I could hear it ticking whenever there was a pause in his speech. You're quite the lad, by all accounts, Mr. Tiny went on. A most remarkable young man. Sacrificed everything to save a friend. There aren't many who would do there aren't many who would do as much. People are so self-censored these days. It's great to see the world can still produce heroes. <laughs> I'm no hero, I said, blushing at the compliment. Of course you are, he insisted. What is a hero but a person who lays everything on the line for the good of somebody else? I smiled proudly. I couldn't understand why Evera was so afraid of this nice old man. There was nothing terrible in Mr. Tiny. I quite liked him. Larden tells me you're reluctant to drink human blood, Mr. Tiny said. I don't blame you. Nasty, repulsive stuff. Can't stand it. Apart from young children, of course. Their blood is scrumptedly umptious. I frowned. You can't drink blood from them, I said. They're too small. If you took blood from a young child, you'd kill it. His eyes widened, and so did his smile. So? He asked softly. A chill ran down my spine. If he had been joking, it would have been in very poor taste. But I could have overlooked it, hadn't I just been laughing about poor Bradley Stretch. But I could tell from his expression that he was perfectly serious. All of a sudden, I knew why this man was so feared. He was evil. Not just bad or nasty, but pure demonic evil. This was a man I could imagine killing thousands of people just to hear them scream. You know, Mr. Tiny said, your face seems familiar. Have we met before, Darren Shan? I shook my head. Are you certain? He asked. You look very familiar. I would have remembered, I gasped. You can't always trust memory, Mr. Tiny smiled. It can be a deceptive monster. Still, no matter. Maybe I'm confusing you with somebody else. By the way his lips twisted into a grin, how I had ever th thought that was a nice smile. I could see he didn't think that, but I was sure he was wrong. There's no way I'd forgotten meeting a creature like this. Down to business, Mr. Tiny said. His hand tightened on the heart-shaped watch, and for a moment they seemed to glow and melt into his ticking face. I blinked and rubbed my eyes. When I looked again, the illusion, which it must have been, had passed. You boys saw me arrive with my little people, Mr. Tiny said. They're new converts to my cause and are a bit unsure of the ropes. Normally I'd stick around and teach them how to get along, but I have business elsewhere. Still, they're smart and I'm sure they'll learn. However, while they're learning, I'd like it if you two fine decent boys would help ease them into the swing of things. You won't have to do much. Mainly I want you to find food for them. They have such big appetites. How about it, boys? I got the permission of your guardians. He nodded at Mr. Tall and Mr. Krebsley, who didn't seem happy about the arrangement, but looked resigned. Will you help poor old Mr. Tiny and his little people? I glanced at Evra. I could see he didn't want to agree to the request, but he nodded his head anyway. I did likewise. Excellent, Mr. Tiny boomed. Young everyone knows what my darling's like, I'm sure. If you have any problems, report to Ibernius and he'll sort you out. Mr. Tiny waved a hand to let us know we could leave. Everett began edging backwards immediately, but I held my ground. Excuse me, I said, summoning all my courage. But why do you call them little people? Mr. Tiny looked around slowly. If he was surprised by my question, he didn't show it though I could see the mouths of Mr. Tall and Mr. Krebsley dropping. Well, because they're little, he explained pleasantly. I know that, I said, but don't they have any other names? A proper name? If somebody mentioned little people to me, I think they were talking about elves or leprechauns. Mr. Tiny smiled. 
They are elves and leprechauns, he said. All around the world, you'll find legends and stories of small magical people. Legends have to start somewhere. These legends started with my short, loyal friends. Are you telling me those dwarves in blue cloaks are elves? I asked disbelievingly. No, he said. Elves don't exist. Those dwarves, as you so rudely put it, were seen long ago by ignorant people who invented names for them. Elves or fairies or spirits. They made up stories about what they were and what they could do. And what can they do? I asked curiously. Mr. Tiny's smile slipped. I heard you were quite the one for asking questions, he growled. But nobody told me you were this nosy. Remember, Darren Shan, curiosity killed the cat. I'm not a cat, I said shakily. Mr. Tiny leaned forward and his face darkened. If you ask more questions, he hissed, you might find yourself turned into one. Nothing in life is forever, nor even the human form. The watch in his hand glowed again, like a red, like a real heart. And I decided the time had come for take my leave. Go to bed now and get a good night's sleep, Mr. Krebsley told me before I left. There will be no lessons tonight. And rise early, boys, Mr. Tiny added, waving goodbye. My little people are always hungry in the mornings. It's not wise to leave their hunger go unattended. You never know what they might set with their minds and teeth on if they go unfed for too long. We hurried out the door and raced back to our tent, where we fell to the floor and listened to our hearts beating loudly. Are you crazy? Evra asked when he could speak. Talking to Mr. Tiny like that? Asking him questions? You must be mad. Yes, I said, thinking back on the encounter, wondering where I got the nerve from. I must be. Evra shook his head in disgust. It was early, but we crawled into bed anyway, where we lay awake for ages, staring at the ceiling of the tent. When I finally dropped off to sleep, I dreamt of Mr. Tiny and his heart-shaped watch. Only, in my dreams, it wasn't a watch. It was a real human heart. Mine. And when he squeezed it, agony. Chapter 15 We rose early and went hunting for food for the little people. We were tired and grumpy, and it took time for us to come to life. After a while, I asked Ever what the little people like to eat. Meat, he replied. Any kind of animal. They don't care. How many animals will we need to catch? I asked. Well, there's twelve of them, but they don't eat a lot. I guess one rabbit or a hedgehog between the two of them. A larger animal, a fox or a dog, might do for three or four. Can you eat hedgehogs? I asked. The little people can, Ever said. They're not fussy. They eat rats and mice too, but we have to catch loads to feed so many, so they're not worth bothering with. We took a sack each and hit off in different directions. Everett told me the meat didn't have to be fresh, so if I found a dead badger or a squirrel, I could stick it in the bag and save some time. I spotted a fox a couple of minutes into the hunt. It had, th it had a chicken in its mouth and was on its way home. I tracked it until the moment was right, then pounced on it from behind a bush and dragged it to the ground. The dead chicken flew from its mouth and it turned snarling to bite me. Before I could attack, I moved swiftly, grabbed its neck, and twisted sharply to the left. There was a loud crack, and that was the end of that fox. I chucked the ticket I chucked the chicken into the bag, a welcome bonus, but hung on to the fox for a few minutes. I needed blood, so I found a vein, 
made a small cut and started sucking. Part of me hated this. It seemed inhuman, but I reminded myself that I wasn't human anymore. I was a half vampire. This was how my kind acted. I felt bad killing foxes and rabbits and pigs and sheep for the first few times, but I got used to it. I had to. Could I get used to drinking human blood? That was the question. I hoped I could avoid feeding on humans, but by the way I was running out of energy, I knew I'd eventually have to. Or die. I tossed the body of the fox into the bag, then continued hunting. I found a family of rabbits washing their ears in a nearby pond. I crept close as I could, then struck without warning. They scattered in fear, but not before I got my sharp fingernails into three of the little ones. I added them to the contents of the bag and decided that would do for this trip. The fox, chicken, and rabbit should easily feed six or seven of the blue hoods. I met Avra back at camp. He'd found a dead dog and a badger and was feeling pretty pleased with himself. The easiest day's hunting I've ever had, he said. Plus, I found a field full of cows. We'll go there tonight and steal one. It'll keep the little people going for at least a day or two. Won't the farmer who owns the Won't the farmer who owns them notice? I asked. There are dozens of them, Everett said. By the time he gets around to counting them, we'll be long gone. But cows cost money, I said. I don't mind killing wild animals, but stealing from a farmer is different. We'll leave money for him, Ever sighed. Where will we get that? I asked. Ever smiled. The one thing we're never short of at the Cirque du Freak is money, he assured me. Later, the chores completed, we teamed up with Sam again. He'd been waiting in the bushes for ages. Why didn't you come to camp? I asked. I didn't like to impose, he said. Besides, I thought somebody might have left the wolfman out. He didn't seem too fond of me when I last saw him yesterday. He's like that with everyone, Everett told him. Maybe, Sam said. But I figure it's best not to take chances. Sam was in a questioning mood. He'd obviously been thinking a lot about us since the day before. Don't you ever wear shoes? He asked Ever. No, Ever said. The soles of my feet are extra tough. What happens if you step on a thorn or a nail? Sam asked. Ever smiled, sat down, and gave Sam his foot. Try scratching it with a sharp twig, he said. Sam broke up a branch and prodded Ever's sole. I looked on with interest. It was like trying to make a hole through the leather. A sharp piece of glass might slice me. Ever said, but it doesn't happen very often, and my skin's getting tougher every year. <laughs> I wish I had skin like that, Sam said enviously. Then he turned to me. How come you wear the same suit all the time? He asked. I glanced down at the suit I'd been buried alive in. I meant to ask for some new clothes, but had forgotten. I like it, I said. I've never seen a kid wearing a suit like that before, Sam said. Not unless it is a wedding or a funeral. Are you forced to wear it? No, I said. Did you ask your parents if you could join the sick? <clears throat> Did you ask your parents if you could join the sick? Everest said then, to Sam's, to distract Sam's attention. No, Sam sighed. I told them about it, of course, but I figured it would be best to take it in stages. I won't tell them until just before I leave, or maybe not until I'm gone. You still plan to join? I asked. You bet, Sam said. I know you try putting me off, but I'll get in somehow. You wait. I'll keep coming around. I'll read books and learn everything there is to know about freak shows. Then I'll go to your boss and state my case. He won't be able to turn me down. Ever and I smiled at each other. We knew Sam's dream would never lead to anything, but we hadn't the heart to tell him. We went to see an old deserted railway station later on, about two kilometers away, which Sam had told us about. It's great, he said. They used to work on trains here, repair, repair and paint them and stuff like that. It was a busy station in its day. Then a new firm set up closer to the city, and this place went bust. It's a great place to play. 
There are rusty old railway tracks, empty sheds and a guardhouse and a couple of ancient train carriages. Is it safe? Ever asked. My mum says it isn't, Sam told us. It's one of the few places she tells me to stay away from. She says I could fall through the roof of one of the carriages or trip on a rail or something. But I've been there loads of times and nothing's happened. It was another sunny day and we were strolling along slowly under the cover of the trees when I smelled something strange. I stopped and sniffed the air. Ever could smell it too. What is that? I asked. I don't know, he said, sniffing the air beside me. Which way is it coming from? I can't tell, I said. It was a thick, heavy, sour smell. Sam hadn't smelled anything and was walking on ahead of us. He realized we weren't beside him, stopped, and turned to see what was keeping us. What's wrong? he asked. Why aren't you... Gotcha! A voice yelled behind me, and before I could move, I felt a firm hand grab my shoulder and spin me around. I glimpsed a large, hairy face, and then I was falling backwards, thrown off balance by the force of the hand. Chapter 16 I landed awkwardly and sprained my arm. I gave a shout of pain, then tried twisting away from the hairy figure above me. Before I could, he was crouching by my side, a fierce look on his face. Oh, hey, man. I didn't hurt you, did I? He had a jolly voice, and I realized my life wasn't in danger. The look on his face was one of concern, not anger. I didn't mean to spook you so much, the man said. I was just trying to scare you a little, man, for fun. I sat up and rubbed my elbow. I'm okay, I said. You sure? It ain't broken, is it? I got herbs that can help, if it is. <laughs> herbs can't mend broken bones, Sam said. He tracked back and was standing beside Evra. You sure can't, the stranger agreed. But they can elevate you to planes of consciousness where worldly concerns like broken bones are nothing but minor blips on the cosmic map. He paused and stroked his beard. Of course, they burn out your brain cells too. Sam's blank face showed that even he hadn't understood that long sentence. I'm okay, I said again. I stood and rotated the arm. I just twisted it. It'll be fine in a couple of minutes. Man, that's good to hear, the stranger sighed. I'd hate to be the cause of bodily harm. Hurt's a bad trip, man. I studied him in more detail. He was a big, he was big, chubby, with a bushy black beard and a long scraggly hair. His clothes were dirty, and he could have had a but and he couldn't have had a bath recently because he stank to high heaven. That's what the strange smell had been. He was so friendly looking, it made me feel foolish thinking about how I'd been afraid of him. Are you kids locals? the man asked. I am, Sam said. These two are with the circus. Circus? The man smiled. There's a circus around here? Oh man, how did I miss it? Where is it? I love the circus. I never pass up a chance to see clowns in action. It's not that sort of circus, Sam told him. It's a freak show. A freak show? The man stared at Sam, then at Everett, whose scales and colour clearly marked him out as one of the performers. Are you part of the freak show, man? He asked. Evra nodded slyly. They don't mistreat you, do they? The man asked. They don't whip you or underfeed you or make you do things you don't want? No, Evra smiled. You're there of your own free will? Yes, Evra said. All of us are. It's our home. Oh, well, that's okay, the man said, smiling once more. You hear rumours about these small travelling shows. You... He slapped his forehead. Oh, man, I haven't introduced myself, have I? I'm so dumb sometimes. RV's the name. RV? That's a funny name, I remarked. He coughed with embarrassment. Well, he said, lowering his voice to a whisper. It's short for Reggie Veggie.
Reggie Veggie? I laughed. Yeah, he grimaced. Reggie's my real name. Reggie Veggie is what they call me in school because I'm a vegetarian. Well, I never liked that, so I asked them to call me RV instead. Some did, but not many. He looked miserable at the memory. You can call me Reggie Veggie if you want, he told us. RV is fine by me, I assured him. Me too, Ever said. And me, Sam added. Cool. RV brightened up. So that's my name out in the open. How about you three? Darren Shan, I told him, and we shook hands. Sam Grest. Everyone. Everyone what? RV asked, as I had when I first met Evra. Just plain Vaughn, Evra said. Oh, RV smiled. Cool. RV was an eco-warrior. He had to stop a road being built. He was a member of NOP, Nature of Supposing Protectors, and had travelled the lengths and breadths of the country, saving forests and lakes and animals and famous landmarks. He offered to show us around his camp, and we jumped at the chance. The railway station could wait. This was an opportunity that wouldn't arise every day. He talked about the environment non-stop as we walked. He told us about all the lousy things being done to Mother Nature, the forests we were destroying, the rivers we were polluting, the air we were poisoning, the animals we were driving to extinction. And this is all in our own country, he said. I'm not talking about stuff that happening somewhere else. This is what we're doing to our own land. NOP were fighting to save the earth from greedy, dangerous humans who didn't care what they did to it. They journeyed up and down the country, trying to make other people aware of the dangers. They gave out pamphlets and books about how to protect the environment. But raising awareness isn't enough, RV told us. It's a start, but we must do more. We have to stop the pollution and destruction of the countryside. Take this place. They were going to build a road through an old burial mound, a place where, bur a, a place where druids buried their dead thousands of years ago. Can you imagine that, man? Destroying part of history just to save drivers 10 or 20 minutes. RV shook his head sadly. These are crazy times, men, he said. Things we're doing to this planet. In the future, assuming there is one, people will look back on what we've done and call us idiotic barbarians. He was very passionate about the environment, and after listening to him for a while, so was Sam, Ever, and me. I hadn't thought about it much before. But after a couple of hours with RV, I realized I should have. As RV said, those who don't think and act now can't complain when the world crumbles on them around their ears later. His campsite was an interesting place. The people, 20 or so, slept in handmade huts which had been built out of branches and leaves and shrubs. Most were as dirty and smelly as RV, but they were also cheerful and kind and generous. How did you stop the roads from being built? Sam asked. We dug tunnels beneath the land, RV said, and we sabotaged the machines they sent in, and we alerted the media. Rich cats have rich cats hate having cameras pointed at them. One TV news crew is as good as twenty active warriors. Ever asked RV if they ever fought hand to hand? RV said NOP didn't believe in violent confrontation but we could see from the look on his face that he wasn't happy about that. If I had my way, he said quietly, we'd give as good as we got. We ain't too nice sometimes. And if I was in charge, I'd give those turkeys a taste of what for. RV invited us to stay for lunch. It wasn't very nice food. There was no meat, just loads of vegetables and, fr and rice and fruit, but we ate plenty to be polite. They have lots of mushrooms as well, large and oddly coloured, but RV wouldn't let us eat any of those. When you're older, man, <laughs> he chuckled. We left shortly after lunch. The members of NOP had duties and jobs to be getting on with, and we didn't want to be in the way. RV told us we could come back any time, but that they'd probably be moving on in a couple of days. We've almost won the fight here, he said. Another few days, and it'll be time to strike out for pastures new. Battles come and go, man, but the war is never ending. We waved goodbye 
and head for home. That RV is strange, Sam said after a while. Imagine giving up everything to go off and fight for animals in the countryside. He's doing what he believes in, Ever said. I know, Sam said, and I'm glad he's doing it. We need people like him. It's a pity there aren't more of his kind. Still, it's an odd way to live, isn't it? You'd have to be very dedicated. I don't think I could become an environmental warrior. Me neither, I agreed. I could, Ever said. You could not, I snorted. Why not, he pouted. I could take my snake and live with them and fight with them. You couldn't, I insisted. Why not? he asked. Because you're not smelly enough, I laughed. Ever pulled a face, then grinned. <laughs> they were a bit on the smelly s they were a bit on the punchy side, weren't they? he admitted. They smell worse than my feet when I haven't changed my socks for a week, Sam goffled. Still, Ever said. I can think of lots of worse ways to spend my time when I grow up. I'd like to be with RV when I'm older. Me too, Sam said. I shrugged. I guess I could get used to it, I agreed. We were in high spirits and talked about NOP and RV and the whole way back to camp. None of us had any idea of the trouble the nice eco-warrior would soon create or the tragedy he would unwillingly cause. <clears throat> Chapter 17 We passed the next few days in leisurely fashion. Ever and me were kept busy with our chores and with feeding the little people. I tried, I, I tried talking to a couple of the silent blue-hooded creatures, but none of them so much as looked at me when I spoke. It was impossible to tell them apart. One stood out because he, or she, or they, were taller than the others, and one was shorter and another limped on his left leg, but the rest looked exactly alike. Sam was helping out more and more around the camp. We didn't take him with us when we went hunting, but we let him lend a hand with most of the other jobs. He was a hard worker, determined to impress us and earn himself a full-time position with the Sikh. I didn't see much of Mr. Krebsley. He knew I had been up to early to hunt for the little people's food, so he left me alone most of the time. I was happy that way. I didn't want him bugging me about drinking human blood. Then Cormac Limbs arrived early one morning, which caused great excitement. You've got to see this guy, Everett said, dragging me behind him. He's the most amazing performer who ever lived. There was already a large crowd around Cormac when we arrived at Mr. Tor's van, where he had reported to. People were slapping him on the back and asking what he'd been up to and where he'd been. He smiled at everybody, shook hands, and answered their questions. He might have been a star, but he wasn't big-headed. Evra Vaughn! He shouted when he saw the snake boy. He reached over and gave Ever a hug. That was my favorite two-legged reptile. Fine, Ever said. Did you shed your skin lately? Cormac asked. Not recently, Ever said. Remember, Cormac said, I want it when you do. It's valuable. Human snake skin is worth more than gold in some countries. You can have as much of it as you like, Ever assured him. Then he pushed me forward. Cormac, this is Darren Shan, a friend of mine. He's new at the circ and has never seen you before. Never seen Cormac limbs, Cormac shouted, pretending to be upset. How can this be? I thought everybody in the world had seen the magnificent Cormac limbs in action. I've never even heard of you, I told him. He clutched his chest as though suffering a heart attack. What is it you do? I asked. Cormac looked around at the crowd. Shall I give a demonstration? Oh, yes, they shouted eagerly. Cormac looked at Mr. Tall, standing at the back of the crowd. Mr. Tall sighed and nodded. You may as well, he said. They won't leave you alone until you do. Very well, Cormac said. 
Stand back and give me room. The crowd moved back immediately. I started to move with them, but Cormac laid a hand on my shoulder and told me to stay. Now, he said to the crowd, I've been traveling for ages and I'm too tired to get through my entire routine, so we'll keep this short and sweet. He made his right hand into a fist, then stuck out his index finger. Darren, will you place this finger in your mouth? He asked. I glanced at Evra, who signaled for me to do as Cormac asked. Now, Cormac said, bite down on it, please. A bit softly. Harder, Cormac said. A bit slightly harder. Come on, boy, Cormac shouted. Put some backbone into it. Work those jaws. Are you a shark or a mouse? Okay. You wanted me to bite hard? Then I would. I opened my mouth and bit down quickly, meaning to give him a shock. Instead, I was the one who got shocked because I bit clean through the finger and snapped it right off. I fell back in terror and spat the dead finger from my mouth. My eyes shot up at Cormac limbs. I expected him to scream, but he only laughed and held up his hand. There was no blood where I had bitten the finger off, only a white, jagged stump. As I watched, the most amazing thing happened. The finger began to grow back. I thought I must be imagining it, but as the seconds passed, it continued to grow, and soon it was full length again. Cormac held it rigidly in place a few seconds longer, then flexed it in and out to show that it was as good as new. The crowd cheered, and I felt my heart settle in my chest. I looked down at the ground where I'd sped up the finger and saw it beginning to rot. Within a minute, it was nothing more than a grayish mound of mold. <laughs> Sorry if I frightened you, Cormac said, giving my head a pat. That's okay, I told him. Should I learn by now not to expect the unexpected around here? Can I feel the new finger? He nodded. It felt no different to any of the others. How do you do it? I asked, amazed. Is it an illusion? No illusion, he said. It's why they call me Cormac Limbs. I've been able to grow new limbs, fingers, toes, arms, legs, ever since I was a nipper. My parents discovered my talent when I had an accident with a kitchen knife and cut off part of my nose. I can grow virtually any part of my body anew, Except my head. I haven't tried cutting that off yet. Best not to tempt fate. Doesn't it hurt? I asked. Eh, a little, he said. But not much. When one of my limbs get cut off, a new one starts to grow almost immediately, so there's only a second or two of pain. It's a bit like... Come, come, Mr. Tall bellowed, cutting him short. We don't have time for a detailed description. This show has been idle for far too long. It's time we entertain the public again, before they forget about us or think we've retired. People, he shouted to the crowd and clapped his hands together. Spread the word. The lull is over. The show goes on tonight. Chapter 18 The camp was buzzing with activity all afternoon. People were rushing about like ants. A large number were working on putting them together as a circus tent. I hadn't seen it before. It was an impressive sight when finished, tall and round and red, decorated with pictures of the performers. Everyone were kept busy, hammering pegs into the ground to hold the tent in place, arranging seats inside, setting up the stage for the show, preparing props for the performers. We had to find tin cans and nuts and bolts from Ram's two bellies to eat, help move the wolfman's cage inside the tent and so on. It was a huge operation, but it moved with incredible speed. Everyone in the camp knew their place and what was expected of them, and there was never any real panic over the course of the day. Everybody worked as part of a team, and things came together smoothly. Sam turned up early evening afternoon. I would have kept him around to help with work, but Everett said he'd be in the way, so we sent him packing. He was upset and slouched off in a sulk, kicking an empty tin can along in front of him. I felt sorry for him, then realized how I could cheer him up. Sam, wait a minute, I shouted. I'll be back in a tick. 
I told Evera, and I'll be back in a tick, I told Evera, then rushed off to find Mr. Toll's van. <clears throat> I knocked once on the door, and it opened instantly. Mr. Toll was standing inside, and before I could say a word, he held out two tickets for entry into the Cirque du Freak. I stared at the tickets, then at Mr. Toll. How did you know? I have my ways. He replied with a smile. I haven't any money, I warned him. I'll take it out of your wages, he said. I frowned. But you don't pay me anything. His smile widened. Clever old me. He handed over the tickets and closed the door in my face before I could thank him. I hurried back to Sam and passed on the tickets. Who are these? he asked. The tickets for tonight's show, I told him. One for you and one for RV. Oh, wow! Sam's, Sam quickly stuck the tickets into his pocket as if he was afraid they might blow away or vanish. Thanks, Darren. No problem, I said. The only thing is, it's a late show. We're starting at 11 and it won't be over until nearly one in the morning. Were you able to make it? Sure, Sam said. I'll sneak out. Mum and Dad go to bed at half past nine every night. They're early birds. If you get caught, I warned him, don't tell them where you're going. My lips are sealed, he promised, then set off at a run to find RV. Except for a quick dinner, there was no further break between then and the start of the show. While Ever left to groom his snake, I set up candles inside the circus tent. There were also five huge chandeliers to be hung, four above the crowd, one over the stage, but the little people handled those. Max, a pretty young woman who sold toys and sweets during the breaks, asked me to help her get the trays ready, so I spent an hour stacking candy webs and edible glass statues and strands of the wolfman's hair. There was, a, there was a new novelty I hadn't seen before, a small model of Cormac limbs. When you cut a part of it, when you cut a part of it off, a new piece grew in its place. I asked Max how it worked, but she didn't know. It's one of Mr. Toll's inventions, she said. He makes, he makes a lot of his stuff himself. I chopped the head off the model and tried peering down the neck to see what was inside, but a new head grew before I could. The models don't last forever, Max, Max said. They rot after a few months. Do you tell people that when they're buying them? I asked. Of course, she said. Mr. Toll insists we let the customers know exactly what they're buying. He doesn't approve of cunning people. Mr. Crapsley sent for me half an hour before the show began. He was dressing in his stage costume when I entered. Polish Madame Octa's cage, he ordered. Then brush your suit and then brush your suit down and clean yourself up. Why? I asked. You are going on with me, he said. My eyes lit up. You mean I'm part of the act? I gasped. A small part, he said. You can bring the cage on and play the flute when it is Madame Octa's time to spin a web over my mouth. Mr. Tall normally does that, doesn't he? Normally, Mr. Krebsley agreed. But we are short on performers tonight, so he is going to be performing himself. Besides, you are better suited to assisting than him. How so? I asked. You look creepier, he said. With your pale face and that awful suit, you look like something out of a horror film. That gave me a bit of a shock. I never thought I was creepy looking. I glanced in the mirror and realized I did look a bit of a fright. Because I hadn't drunk human blood, I was much paler than I should have been. The dirty suit made me look even more ghost-like. I made up my mind to find something new to wear in the morning. The show started promptly at 11. I hadn't expected much of a crowd. We were in the middle of nowhere and hadn't much time to notify people about the show, but the tent was packed. Where did they all come from? I whispered to Evera as we watched Mr. Tall introduce the Wolfman. Everywhere, he replied quietly. People always know when one of our shows is on. Besides, though he only told us about it today, Mr. Tall probably knew we'd be playing tonight ever since we set up camp. 
I watched the show from the wings, enjoying it even more than the first time I'd seen it, because now I knew the people involved and felt like part of the family. Hunt's hands went on after the wolfmen, followed by Rama's two bellies. We had our first break, then Mr. Tall took to the stage and darted around the place, never seeming to move, merely vanishing from one spot and appearing somewhere new. Next up was Truska. Then it was my turn to go on stage with Mr. Krebsley and Madame Oxa. The lights were low, but my vampire vision helped me pick out the faces of Sam and RV in the crowd. They were stunned to see me, but clapped louder than anybody else. I had to hide my smile of delight. Mr. Krebsley had told me to look miserable and glum to impress the crowd. I stood to one side as Mr. Krebsley made a speech about how deadly Madame Octa was, then opened the door to her cage as an assistant led a goat onto the stage. There was a loud, angry gasp when Madame Octa killed the goat. It came from RV. I knew then I shouldn't have invited him. I'd forgotten how fond of animals he was, but it was too late to withdraw my invitation. I was slightly nervous when it was my time to play the flute and control Madame Octa feeling every set of eyes in the tent focus on me. I'd never performed to a crowd before, and for a few seconds, I was afraid my lips wouldn't work or forget the tune. But once I started blowing and sending my thoughts to Madame Octa, I settled into my stride. As she weaved her web across Mr. Krebsley's lips, it suddenly struck me that I could get rid of him now if I wanted. I could make her bite him. The idea shocked me. I thought about killing him before, but never seriously, and not since we joined the sick. Now, here he was, his life in my hands. All it would take was one slip. I could claim it was an accident. Nobody would be able to prove otherwise. I watched the spider move back and forth, up and down, her poisonous fangs glinting under the lights of the chandelier. The heat from the candle seemed immense. I was sweating freely. It occurred to me that I could blame the slip of my fingers on the sweat. Over his mouth, she spun her web. His hands were down by his sides. He wouldn't be able to stop her. One wrong tooth on the flute was all it needed. One broken note to sever the train of thought between the two of us. And I didn't do it. I played perfectly and safely. I wasn't sure why I'd spared the vampire. Maybe because Mr. Tall might know I killed him. Maybe because I needed Mr. Crepsley to teach me how to survive. Or maybe because I just want, didn't want to become a killer. Or maybe, just maybe, because I was starting to like the vampire. After all, he brought me into the sick and made me a part of his act. I wouldn't have met Ever and Sam if, I hadn't, if it hadn't been for him. He'd been kind to me. As kind as he could be. Whatever the reason, I didn't let Madame Octa kill her master. And at the end of the act, we took our bows and exited together. You thought about killing me, Mr. Krebsley said softly once we were backstage. What do you mean? I played dumb. You know what I mean, he said. There was a pause. It would not have worked. I milked most of the poison from her fangs long before we went on. Killing the goat took the rest out of her. It was a test? I stared at him, and my hatred grew again. I thought you were being nice to me, I cried. And all the time it was just a rotten old test. His face was grave. I had to know, he said. I had to know if I could rely on you. Well, listen to this, I growled, standing on my toes in order to go eyeball to eyeball with him. Your test was useless. I didn't kill you this time, but if I ever get the chance again, I'll take it. I stormed off in a huff, without another word, too upset to stick around to see your Cormac limbs by the end of the show. Feeling betrayed, even though deep down, I knew what he saved made sense. Chapter 19. I was still upset the next morning. Everett kept asking me what was wrong, but I wouldn't tell him. 
I didn't want him to know I've been thinking about killing Mr. Krebsley. Everett told me he'd met Sam and RV after the show. Sam loved it, Everett said, especially Cormac Limbs. He said it stayed to see Cormac in action. When he sawed his legs off. I'll see him next time, I said. How'd RV take it? Everett frowned. He wasn't happy. Upset about the goat? I asked. Yes, Everett said. But not just that. I said we bought the goat from a butcher, so it would have been killed anyway. It was the wolf man, the snake, and Mr. Crepsley's spider which bothered him the most. What was wrong with them? I asked. He was afraid they weren't being treated right. He didn't like the idea of them being locked in cages. I told him they weren't, except for the spider. I said the wolfman was quiet as a lamb off stage, and I showed him a snake and how he slept with me. Did he believe you about the wolfman? I asked. I think so, Everett said, though he still seemed suspicious when leaving. And he was very interested in their eating habits. He wanted to know where we fed them, how often, and where we got the food. We're going to have to be careful with RV. He could cause problems. Luckily, he should be leaving in a day or two, but until then, caution. We passed the day quietly. Sam didn't turn up until late in the afternoon, and none of us was in much of a mood for playing. It was a cloudy day, and we were all a bit out of sorts. Sam only stayed for half an hour, then trotted off home again. Mr. Krebsley summoned me to his tent shortly after sunset. I wasn't going. I wasn't going to go, but I decided it was best not to annoy him too much. He was my guardian, after all, and could probably have, met, and could probably have me booted out of the Siècle de Free. What do you want? I snapped when I arrived. Stand over here where I can see you better, the vampire said. He tilted my head backwards with his bony fingers and rolled my eyelids to check the whites of my eyes. He told me to open my mouth and peer down my throat. Then he checked my pulse and reflexes. How do you feel? He asked. Tired, I said. Weak, he asked. Sick? A bit. He grunted. Have you been drinking much blood lately? He asked. As much as I meant to, I said. But no human blood? No, I said softly. Okay, he said. Get ready. We are going out. Hunting? I asked. He shook his head. To see a friend. I got up in his bag outside the tent and he began running. When we were clear of the camp, he flitted and the whole world blurred around us. It didn't take much notice of where we were going. I was more concerned with my suit. I'd forgotten to get new clothes, and now, the more I examined it, the worse it seemed. There were dozens of small holes and rips, and the color was a shade grayer than it was supposed to be because of the dirt and dust. Many strands of thread and fibers had come loose, and every time I shook an arm or leg, I appeared to be shedding hairs. I'd never been very worried about clothes, but I didn't want to look like a tramp. Tomorrow, I would definitely find something new to wear. After a while, we reached the city, and Mr. Krebsley slowed. He stopped outside the back of a tall building. I wanted to ask where we were, but he put a finger to his lips and made the sign for silence. The back door was locked, but Mr. Krebsley laid a hand over it and clicked his fingers of his other hand. It opened instantly. He led the way through a long, dark corridor, then up a set of stairs and onto a brightly lit hallway. After a few minutes, we came to a white desk. Mr. Krebsley glanced around to make sure we weren't alone, then rang the bell that hung from one of the walls. A figure appeared behind the glass wall on the other side of the desk. The door in the glass wall opened, and a ginger-haired man in a white uniform and green mask stepped through. He looked like a doctor. Help me up, he began, then stopped. Larton Krebsley! What the hell are you doing here, you old devil? The man pulled down his mask, and I saw he was grinning. Hello, Jimmy, Mr. Krebsley said. The two shook hands and smiled at each other. Long time no see. <laughs> Not as long as I thought it would be, 
the man called Jimmy said. I heard you had been killed. An old foe had finally rammed a stake through your rotten heart, or so the story went. You should not believe everything you hear, Mr. Krebsley said. He placed a hand on my shoulder and nudged me forward. Jimmy, this is Darren Shan, a traveling companion of mine. Darren, this is Jimmy Ovo, an old friend and the world's finest pathologist. Hello, I said. Pleased to meet you, Jimmy said, shaking my hand. You aren't, uh, I mean, do you belong to the club? He is a vampire. Mr. Krebsley said. Only half, I snapped. I'm not a full vampire. Please, Jimmy winced. Don't use that word. I know what you guys are, and I'm fine about it, but that V word never fails to freak me out. He shivered playfully. I think it's because of all the horror movies I watched when I was a kid. I know you're not like those cinema monsters, but it's hard to get the image out of my mind. What's a pathologist do? I asked. I cut corpses open to see how they died, Jimmy explained. I don't do it with many bodies, just those who died in the suspicious circumstances. This is a city morgue, Mr. Presley said. They store bodies that arrive dead at the hospital or die whilst there. Is that where you keep them? I asked Jimmy, pointing at this room behind the glass wall. Yep, he said cheerfully. He swung up a section of the desk and invited us through. I was nervous. I expected to see dozens of tables heaped high with sliced open bodies, but it wasn't like that. There was one dead body covered from head to toe with a long sheet, but that was the only one I could spot. Otherwise, it was a huge well-lit room with large filing cabinets set in the walls and lots of medical equipment scattered around the place. How was business? Mr. Krebsley asked as we sat on three chairs near the corpse on the table. Jimmy and Mr. Krebsley took no notice of the dead person, and as, and as I didn't want to look out of place, neither did I. Mm, slow enough, Jimmy answered. The weather's been good, and there haven't been many road accidents. No strange diseases, no food epidemics, no collapsing buildings. And by the way, he, ha he added, I had an old friend of yours in here a few years back. Oh, Mr. Krebsley responded politely. Who was that? Jimmy sniffed heavily through his nose, then cleared his throat. <laughs> Gavna Pearl, Mr. Krebsley hooted with delight. How is the old dog? As clumsy as ever. They started talking about their friend, Gavna Pearl. I glanced around curiously while they were speaking, wondering where the bodies were kept. Finally, when they paused for breath, I asked Jimmy. He got to his feet and told me to follow. He led the way to a large filing cabinet and pulled one of the drawers out. There was a hissing sound and a cloud of cold air rose from inside the drawer. When it cleared, I saw a sheet covered form and realized the filing cabinets weren't filing cabinets at all. They were refrigerated coffins. We store bodies here until they're ready, Timmy said, or until their next of kin come to collect them. I looked around the room, quickly counting the many rows of drawer doors. Is there a body behind all of these? I asked. Jimmy shook his head. We've only got six guests at the moment, not counting the one on the table. Like I said, it's quiet. Mind you, even during our busiest times, most of our storage space goes unused. It's rare for us to be half full. We just like to be prepared for the worst. Any fresh bodies in stock? Mr. Krebsley asked. Wait a minute and I'll check, Jimmy said. He consulted a large pad and flicked through a few pages. Uh, there's a man in his thirties, Jimmy said. Died in a car crash just over eight hours ago. Nothing fresher, Mr. Krebsley asked. Afraid not, Jimmy replied. Mr. Krebsley sighed. <sighs> you will have to do. Wait a minute, I said. You're not going to drink from a dead person, are you? No, Mr. Krebsley said. He reached inside his cloak and produced several of his small bottles in which he stored his supply of human blood. I've come for a refill. You can't, I gasped. Why not, he asked. 
It isn't right. It's not fair to drink from the dead. Besides, the blight will have turned sour. It will not be at its best, Mr. Kre Mr. Kretschley agreed. But it will do for bottling. And I disagree. A corpse is the ideal person to drain, since it has, only, since it has no use for the blood. It will take a lot to fill these bottles. Too much to take from a living person. Not if you took a bit from several, I protested. True, he said. But that will require time, effort, and risk. It is easier this way. Aaron doesn't speak like a vampire, Jimmy remarked. He is still learning, Mr. Crutchley grunted. Now, lead the way to the body, please. We have not got all night. I knew it would be pointless to argue further, so I shut my mouth and followed silently behind them. Jimmy slid out the body of a tall, blonde-haired man and whipped back the sheet. There was a nasty bruise on the dead body, on the, on the, on the dead man's head, and his body was very white, but otherwise he looked like he might be sleeping. Mr. Krebsley made a long, deep cross across the man. <sighs> Mr. Krebsley made a long, deep cut across the man's chest, bearing his heart. He arranged the bottles beside the corpse, then got out a tube and stuck one into the end of the first bottles. He stuck the other end into the dead man's heart, then wrapped, the f then wrapped his fist around the organ and squeezed it like a pump. Slowly, blood crept along the tube and into the bottle. When it was nearly full, Mr. Krebsley pulled the tube out and jammed a cork into the neck of the bottle. He stuck the mouth of the tube onto the second bottle and started filling that one. Raising the first bottle, he swallowed a mouthful and rolled it around his gums as though tasting wine. Mm. Good, he grunted, licking his lips. It is pure. We can use it. He filled eight bottles, then turned to me with a serious look in his face. Darren, he said, I know you are reluctant to drink human blood, but it is time you got over your fear. No, I said immediately. <sighs> Come now, Darren, he growled. This person is dead. His blood is no good to him anymore. I can't, I said, not from a corpse. But you will not drink from a live person, Mr. Krebsley exploded. You will have to drink human blood eventually. This is the best way to start. Um, listen, guys, Jimmy said. If you're going to feed, I should get out of... Quiet, Mr. Krebsley snapped. His eyes were burning into me. You have to drink, he said firmly. You are a vampire's assistant. It is time you behaved like one. Not tonight, I begged. Another time, when we go hunting. From a living person. I can't drink from a corpse. It's disgusting. Mr. Krebsley sighed and shook his head. <sighs> One night, you will realize just how silly you are being, he said. I just hope by that time, you're not beyond being saved. Mr. Krebsley thanked Jimmy Ovo for his help and the two got to talking about the past and their friends. I sat by myself while they chatted, feeling miserable, wondering how long I could go without human blood. When they were finished, we walked downstairs. Jimmy came with us and waved goodbye. He was a nice man, and I was sorry we had to meet under such dark circumstances. Mr. Krebsley didn't say anything the whole way home, and when we arrived back at the Cirque du Free, he angrily tossed me to one side and pointed a finger at me. If you die, he said, it is not my fault. Okay, I replied. <sighs> Stupid boy, he grumbled, then stormed off to his coffin. I stayed up a while longer and watched the sun rising. I thought a lot about my situation and what would happen when my strength faded and I began to die. A half vampire who wouldn't drink blood would have been funny if it wasn't so deadly. What should I do? That was the question which kept me awake long after the sun had risen. What should I do? Abandon my principles and drink human blood? Or stay true to my humanity and die? <clears throat> Chapter 
Chapter 20. I stayed inside my tent most of the day and didn't even go out to say hello to Sam when he came around. My spirits were at their lowest ever. I didn't feel like I belonged anywhere any longer. I couldn't be a human and wouldn't be a vampire. I was torn between the two. I got a lot of sleep that night and the next day felt better. The sun was shining and although I knew my problems hadn't gone away, I was able to overlook them for the time being. Every snake was poorly. She picked up a virus and never had to stay in to look after her. When Sam turned up, we decided to visit that old deserted railway station of his. Ever didn't mind being left behind. He'd, he'd come with us another time. <clears throat> the railway station was cool. There was a huge circular yard paved with cracked stones, a three-story house which had, which, had, which had served as the guard's house, a couple of old sheds, and several abandoned train carriages. There were also railway tracks running everywhere you looked, overgrown with weeds and grass. Sam and I walked along some of the tracks and pretended we were on tight ropes high above the ground. Every time one of us slipped, he had to scream and pretend to fall heavily to earth. I was much better at the game than Sam, because my unique vampire powers meant that my sense of balance was better than any human's. We explored a few of the old carriages. A couple were in a sorry state, but most were okay. Very dusty and dirty, but otherwise in good condition. I couldn't understand why they had been left here to rot. We climbed up on top of the roof of one of the carriages and stretched out to enjoy the sun. You know what we should do? Sam said after a while. What? I asked. Become blood brothers. I propped myself up on an elbow and stared. Blood brothers? I asked. What for? And how's it done? It'll be fun, he said. We each make a small cut in one of our hands, then join them together and swear an oath to be best friends forever. <laughs> that sounds all right, I agreed. Do you have a knife? We can use some glass, Sam said. He slid over to the edge of the roof, reached down, and snapped a piece of glass out of one of the carriage's windows. When he returned, he made a small cut in the fleshy part of his palm, then handed me the glass. I was about to cut my palm when I remembered the vampire blood in my veins. I didn't think a small amount could do Sam any harm, but then again... I lowered the glass and shook my head. No, I said. I don't want to do it. Come on, Sam urged. There's no need to be afraid. You only have to make a small cut. No, I said again. Coward, he snorted. You're afraid. Chicken, coward, he began to sing. Cowardly, cowardly custard, buy yourselves some mustard. Okay, I'm a coward, I laughed. It was easier to lie than tell the truth. Everybody's afraid of something. I didn't see you rushing to watch the Wolfman the other day. Sam pulled a face. That's different. Horses for courses, I said smugly. What does that mean? He asked. I'm not sure, I admitted. It's something my dad used to say. We joked about some more, then hopped down and crossed the yard into the guard's house. The doors had rotted off years ago, and most of the glass in the windows had fallen out. We walked through a couple of small rooms into a larger one, which had been the living room. There was a huge hole in the middle of the floor, which we carefully avoided. Look up, Sam told me. I did, and discovered I was gazing directly at the roof. The floors between had fallen in, had fallen in some time over the years, and all that was left of them were jagged edges around the sides. I could see sunlight shining down through several holes in the roof. Follow me, Sam said, and led me to a staircase at the side of the room. He started up. I followed slowly, not sure if this was wise. The steps were creaky and looked as if they might collapse, but not wishing to be called a chicken twice in the same day. We stopped at the third floor, where the stairs ran out. You could touch the floor from here, and we did. You could touch the roof from here, 
and we did. Can we get out onto the roof? I asked. Yes, Sam said, but it's too dangerous. The slates are loose. You could slide off. Anyway, there's something better up here than the roof. He set off along the side of, an, of the uppermost room of the house. The ledge was about half a meter wide most of the way, but I kept my back to the wall, not wanting to take any chances. This bit of floor won't collapse, will it? I asked nervously. It never has before, Sam replied. But that's the first time for everything. And thanks for setting my mind at ease, I grumbled. Sam stopped a bit further on. I craned my neck so I could see past him and realized we had come to a set of rafters. There were six or seven of them, long pieces of wood stretching from one side of the room to the other. This used to be an this used to be the attic, Sam explained. Yeah, I guess that, I told him. He looked back at me and grinned. But can you guess what we're going to do next? He said, he asked. I stared at him, then down at the rafters. You can't mean... You aren't going to... You're going to walk across, right? Right, he said, and set his left foot on the rafter. Sam, this isn't a good idea, I said. You looked unsteady on the railway tracks. If you stumble up here... I won't, he said. I was only fooling down below. He set his other foot on the wooden rafter and began walking. He went slowly, his arms stretched out on either side. My heart was in my mouth. I was certain he'd fall. I glanced down and knew he wouldn't survive if he fell. There were four stories if you included the basement. It was a long drop, a deadly one. But Sam made it across safely to the other side, where he turned and took a bow. You're crazy, I yelled. No, he said, just brave. How about you? Care to chance it? It'd be easier for you than it was for me. What do you mean? I asked. Chickens have wings, he shouted. That did it. I'd show him. Taking a deep breath, I set across, moving quicker than Sam had, making full use of my vampire abilities. I didn't look down and tried not to think about what I was doing. And in a couple of seconds, I was across and standing beside Sam. Wow, he was impressed. I didn't think you'd do it. Certainly not so quickly. You don't travel with the sick without picking up a few tricks, I said, pleased with myself. Do you think I could go that fast? Sam asked. I wouldn't try it, I advised him. But you can't do it again, he dared me. Just watch, I said and darted back across even faster. We spent a fun few minutes crossing over and back, taking each of the rafters in turn. Then we crossed at the same time on different rafters, yelling and laughing at one another. Sam stopped in the middle of his rafter and turned to face me. Hey, he shouted, let's play mirrors. What's that? I asked. I do something and you have to copy me. He shook his left hand above his head. Like this. Oh, I said, and shook my hand. Okay, as long as you don't jump to your death, that's the one thing I won't copy. He laughed, then pulled a face. I pulled one too. Then he slowly stood on one leg. I did likewise. Next, he bent and touched his toes. I followed his example. I couldn't wait until it was my turn. I'd do a few things, like jump from one rafter to the next that he couldn't possibly copy. For once, I was glad of my vampire blood. Naturally, that was the moment when it went and let me down. There was no warning. One second I was beginning to stand, having bent to touch my toes. The next, my head was spinning, my arms were flapping, and my legs were shaking. This wasn't my first dizzy spell. I'd had several recently, but I hadn't taken much notice before. I just sat down and waited for the dizziness to pass. This time was different. I was four stories up, and there was nowhere to sit. I tried lowering myself, thinking I could cling to the rafter and crawl to safety. But before I could get low enough, my feet slipped from beneath me, and I fell. I'm gonna get some more water. <clears throat>
Good old H2O. Chapter 21. Although my vampire blood was responsible for getting me into this mess on the rafters, it also saved my life. As I fell, I stuck out an arm, more in hope than anything else, and my hand caught the rafter. If I'd been an ordinary human boy, I wouldn't have the strength to hold on, but I wasn't ordinary. I was half vampire. And even though I was dizzy, I was able to grab tight and cling on. I swung about, I swung above the four-story drop, eyes shut, hanging on by those slim four fingers and my thumb. Darren, hang on! Sam shouted. Sam shouted. He didn't need to tell me that. I was hardly going to let go. I'm coming over, Sam said. I'll be there as fast as I can. Don't let go and don't panic. He went on talking as he made his way across, calming me down, telling me it would be all right. He'd rescue me. I had to relax. Everything was fine. His words helped. They gave me something apart from the drop to think about. If not for Sam, I'd have been a goner. I felt him start out along my rafter. The wood creaked, and for one terrible moment, I thought the weight would cause it to break and send us both plummeting to our deaths. But it held, and he closed the gap, crawling along his stomach, quickly but carefully. Sam paused when he reached me. Now, he said, I'm going to grab your wrist with my right hand. I'll do it slowly. Don't move while I'm doing it, and don't snatch at me with your free hand, okay? Okay, I said. I felt his hand close over my wrist. Don't let go of the rafter, he said. I won't, I promised. I don't have the strength to pull you up, he told me. So I'm going to swing you from one side to the other. Stretch out your, stretch your free arm out. When you're able, make a grunt for the rafter. If you miss, don't panic. I'll still be holding on. If you get a grip, stay still for a few seconds and give your body a chance to relax. Then we can hold you up. Got that? Got it, Captain, I said, grinning nervously. Okay, here goes. And remember, everything will be all right. It's going to work. You will survive. He began swinging me, lightly at first, then a bit harder. I was tempted to snatch at the rafter after a few swings, but forced myself to wait. When I felt I was swinging high enough, I stretched out my fingers, concentrated on the thin plank of wood, and grabbed. I caught it. I was able to relax a little, and then the rest of my muscles of my right arm. Do you feel ready to pull yourself up? Sam asked. Yes, I said. I'll help you get your upper body up, he said. When your belly is safe across the rafter, I'll get out of the way and give you and give your and give you room to draw your legs up. Sam put his right hand on the collar of my shirt and jacket to catch me if I slipped and and helped yank me upwards. I scraped my chest and belly on the rafter, but the pain didn't bother me. In fact, I welcomed it. It meant I was alive. When I was safe, Sam backed off and my and I got my legs up. I crawled after him, moving slower than necessary. When I reached the ledge, I stayed crouched low and didn't stand until we got to the stairs. Then I leaned against the wall and let out a long, shuddering sigh of relief. Well, Sam said to the left of me. That was fun. Do you want to do it again? I think he was joking. <clears throat> Chapter 22 Later, after I had stumbled down the stairs, my sense of balance was still dodgy, but getting better. We walked back to the carriages and rested in the shadow of one. You saved my life, I said softly. <laughs> it was nothing, Sam said. You'd have done the same for me. Probably, I said. But I wasn't called upon to help. I wasn't the one who had to use his head and act coolly. You saved me, Sam. I owe you my life. <laughs> Keep it, he laughed. What would I do with it? 
I'm serious, Sam. I owe you, big time. Anything you ever want or need, just ask, and I'll move heaven and earth to get it for you. You mean that? Cross my heart, I swore. There is one thing, he said. Name it. I want to join the Cirque du Freak. Sam, I groaned. You asked what I wanted, so I'm telling you, he replied. It's not that easy, I protested. Yes, it is, he said. You can talk to the owner and put in a good word for me. Come on, Darren. Did you mean what you said or not? All right, I sighed. I'll ask Mr. Tor. When? Today, I promised. As soon as I get back. All right, Sam punched the air happily. But if he says no, I warned him. That's the end of it, okay? I'll do what I can, but if Mr. Tor says no, that means no. Sure, Sam said. That's fine by me. Maybe there's a job for me too, somebody said behind my back. I spun around quickly, and there was RV, smiling strangely. Ugh, you shouldn't creep up on people like that, I snapped. You gave me a fright. Sorry, man, RV said, but he didn't look very sorry. What are you doing out here? Sam asked. I wanted to find Darren, RV said. I never got a chance to thank him for my ticket. Ah, oh, that's okay, I said. I'm sorry I wasn't around to see you when I finished, but I had business elsewhere. Sure, RV said, sitting down on the track beside me. I can understand that. For sure that size, there must be lots to do, huh? Bet they keep you real busy, right, man? Right, I said. RV beamed at the two of us. There was something about the way he was smiling that made me uneasy. It wasn't a nice smile. Tell me, RV said. That was the wolf man doing. Yeah, he's fine, I said. He's chained up all the time, isn't he? RV asked. No, I said, remembering Ever's warning. Isn't he? RV acted surprised. A wild beast like him, savage and dangerous, and he isn't locked up. He's not really that dangerous, I said. It's an act. He's pretty tame, actually. I could see Sam staring at me. He knew how wild the wolfman was and couldn't understand why I was lying. Tell me, man. What does a thing like that eat? RV asked. Steak, pork chops, sausages. I forced a smile. The usual stuff, all store-bought. Really? What about the goat that the spider bit? Who eats that? I don't know. Every said the two of you bought the goat from the local farmer. Did it cost much? Not really, I said. It was quite sick, so it... I stopped. Ever had told RV we bought the goat from a butcher, not a farmer. See, I've been doing a spot of investigating, man, RV said softly. Everybody else in my camp has been busy getting ready to move on. But I've been walking around, counting sheep and cows, asking questions, digging for bones. Animals have been vanishing, RV continued. The farmers aren't taking much notice. They don't mind the odd one or two going missing, but it fascinates me. Who do you think could be taking a man? I didn't answer. Another thing. He said. I was strolling along the river you cramped by, and do you know what I found downstream? Lots of small bones and scraps of skin and meat. Where do you think they could have come from, Darren? I don't know, I said. Then I stood up. I have to be going now. I'm expected back this sick. Jobs to do. Don't let me keep you, RV smiled. When are you breaking camp? I asked. I might pop over to say goodbye before you leave. That's nice of you, RV said. But don't worry, man. I won't be going anywhere soon. I frowned. I thought you said you were moving on. 
NOP are moving on, he said. In fact, they've already moved. They pulled out yesterday evening. He smiled icily. But I'm staying a while longer. There are a few things I want to check out. Oh. Inside my head, I cursed loudly. But outside, I pretended to be happy. Oh, that's good news. Well, see you around. Oh, yes, Avi said. You'll see me around, man. You can bet on that. You'll be seeing plenty of me. I grinned awkwardly. So long for now, I said. So long, Avi replied. Wait up, Sam called. I'll come with you. No, I said. Come tomorrow. I'll have an answer from Mr. Tall for you then. Bye. I took off before either of them could say anything else. Avi's interest in the disappearance of the animals worried me at first. But as I walked back to camp, I began to relax. When all was said and done, he was only a hairy, harmless human, while most of us in the Cirque du Freak were strange, powerful beings. What could he possibly do to hurt us? Chapter 23. I meant to report to straight to Mr. Tor when I got back, to tell him about RV, but as I was heading for his van, Truska, the lady who was able to grow an incredible beard, grabbed my arm and made signs that she wanted me to follow her. She led me to her tent. It was decorated more fancily than most of the other tents and vans. The walls were covered with mirrors and paintings. There were huge wardrobes and dressing tables and an enormous four-poster bed. Truska said something of Tushka said something in a strange, seal-like voice, then stood me in the center of the room and made a sign that I wasn't to move. She fetched a measuring tape and measured my body. When she'd finished, she pursed her lips and thought for a few seconds, then clicked her fingers and hurried to one of the wardrobes. She rooted through it, emerging with a pair of trousers. She found a shirt in another wardrobe, a jacket in another, and a pair of shoes in a large chest. She let me pick my own vest, underpants, and socks from one of the dressing table drawers. I stepped behind a silk screen to dress. Everyone must have told her about my wish to find new clothes. It was a good job he had, as I would have probably kept on forgetting. Truska clapped her hands when I came out and quickly pushed me in front of a mirror. The clothes fit perfectly, and to my surprise, I looked super cool. The shirt was a light green color, the trousers were dark purple, while the jacket was gold and blue. Truska found a long, red, a long length of red satin cloth and wrapped it around my middle, and that, compl and that completed the picture. I looked just like a pirate. <laughs> this is great, I told her. Uh, the only thing is, I said, pointing at my feet, the shoes are a bit tight. Truska took back the shoes and found a new pair. These were softer than the first, and the toes curled up like Sinbad the Sailors. I took an immediate shine to them. Thanks, Truska, I said, and started to leave. She raised her hand, and I stopped. She pulled a chair over to one of the taller wardrobes and stood on it, reached up, and brought down a huge round box. She plopped it on the floor, opened it, and pulled out a small brown hat with a feather in it the sort that Robin Hood had might have worn. Before I could put the hat on, she made me sit down, got a pair of scissors, and gave me a haircut, which I badly needed. The haircut and the hat were the icing and the cake. I almost didn't recognize myself in the mirror when I looked this time. Oh, Truska, I said. I... I... I couldn't find the words, so instead I threw my arms around her and gave her a big, sloppy kiss. I felt embarrassed when I let go. I was glad none of my friends had been around to see, but Truska was beaming. I rushed off to show Ever my new look. He thought the clothes were great, but swore he'd never asked Truska to help me. He said she must have either got sick of seeing me look so scruffy, or Mr. Krebsley had asked her to fix me up, or she'd done it because she fancied me. She does not fancy me, I shouted. Truska loves Darren. She's, he's saying, 
Trubisky loves Darren. Oh, shut up, you slimy excuse for a reptile. I growled. He laughed, not offended in the slightest. Darren and Trubisky sitting in the tree, he sang. K-I-S-S-I-N-G. First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes Darren with the vampire carriage. I gave a roar, jumped on him, wrestled him to the ground, and wouldn't let go until he cried for mercy. When we were finished, Everett went back to looking after his snake, while I went outside and got on with today's jobs. I was on the go non-stop, because I had to cover for Everett and do the work of two. With all that coming and going, and the excitement of having new clothes, I completely forgot about RV and telling Mr. Tor about the eco-warrior's threat to investigate the disappearing animals. If I hadn't been so absent-minded, maybe things would have turned out differently, and perhaps our stay wouldn't have ended in bloodshed and tears. Chapter 24 I was ready to drop by the time night came. The activity had worn me out. Ever had warned me not to sleep in his tent tonight. His snake was in a foul mood because of the virus and might bite. So I headed for Mr. Crestley's tent and made a bed on the floor beside Madame Octa's cage. I fell asleep within a couple of minutes of lying down. Sometime later, as I was dreaming, something caught my throat and made me gag. I coughed and woke. There was a finger, there was a figure above me, holding a small bottle to my mouth, trying to force a liquid down me. My first strange, terrified thought was, it's Mr. Tiny. I bit the top of the bottle, cutting my lips, spilling most of the liquid. The man cursed, grabbed my chin, and prized my gums apart. He tried pouring the last of the liquid into my open mouth, but I spat it out. The man cursed again, and let go, and slumped back. As my heartbeat slowed, I saw that it wasn't Mr. Tiny. It was Mr. Krepsley. <laughs> what the hell were you trying to do? I screamed angrily. I was too mad to feel the pain of my cut lips. He showed me the remains of the small bottle, one of the containers he used to store human blood. <laughs> you were trying to get me to drink, I gasped. You have to, Mr. Krepsley said. You're wasting away, Darren. If you go on like this, you will be dead within a week. If you do not have the courage to drink, it must be forced into you. I stared at him savagely. He looked uncomfortable and turned his eyes away from me. <clears throat> I was trying to help, he said. If you ever try that again, I said slowly, I'll kill you. I'll wait until day, then creep in and chop your head off. He could tell I was serious, because he nodded glumly. Never again. Never again, he agreed. I knew it would not work, but I had to try. If you had swallowed even a little, it would have kept you going a while longer. Once you had the taste, you might not be so afraid to drink again. I'll never have the taste, I roared. I won't drink human blood. I don't care if I do die. I won't drink it. Very well, he sighed. I have done my best. If you insist on being stupid, on your own head, be it. I'm not being stupid. I'm being human, I growled. But you are not human, he said softly. I know, I replied. But I want to be. I want to be like Sam. I want to have a family and ordinary friends. I want to grow old at the usual rate. I don't want to spend my life drinking blood and feeding off humans, worrying about sunlight and the vampire hunters. Too bad, Mr. Crepley said. It is the hand you have been dealt. I hate you, I snarled. Too bad, he said again. You are stuck with me. If it is any compensation, he added. I'm none too fond of you either. Turning you into a hard vampire was the worst mistake I have ever made. So why not free me? I wailed. I cannot, he said. 
I would if I could. Of course, you are free to leave anytime you like. I stared at him suspiciously. Really? I asked. Really? He said. I do not mind. In fact, I would prefer it if you did. That way you would no longer be my responsibility. I would not have to watch you die. I shook my head slowly. I don't understand you at all, I said. He smiled most tenderly. Nor are you, he said. We laughed a little, and then things returned to normal. I didn't like what Mr. Krebsley had tried, but I understood why he tried it. You can't really hate someone who has their best interest at heart. I told him what I had done that day, about going to the railway yard with Sam, and how he saved my life. I also told him about becoming Sam's blood brother. <laughs> it is a good job you stopped when you did, Mr. Krebsley said. What would have happened if I hadn't? I asked. Your blood would have tainted his. He would have developed a taste for raw meat. He would have hung around butcher shops, staring in the windows. He would have aged at a slightly slower rate than normal. It would not have been much of a difference, but it would have been enough. Enough to do what? I asked. Drive him mad, Mr. Crepley said. He would not have understood what was happening. He would have thought he was evil. He would have not known why his life had changed. Within ten years, he would have been a screaming wreck. I shivered at the thought of how close I had come to destroying Sam's life. This sort of thing was precisely why I had to stay with Mr. Krebsley, until I learned everything about being a half-vampire. What do you think of Sam? I asked. I have not seen much of him, Mr. Krebsley said. He comes mostly by day, but he seems nice, very bright. He's been helping Ever and me with chores, I said. I know. He's a good worker. So I've heard. I licked my lips nervously. He wants to join the Sikh, I said. Mr. Krebsley's face darkened. I was going to ask Mr. Tall about it, but I forgot. I'll ask tomorrow. What do you think he'll say? He will say that you will have to ask me. Children cannot join the Cirque du Freak unless an independent member agrees to be their guardian. I can be his guardian, I said. You are not old enough. It would have to be me. I would have to give my permission, but I will not. Why? I asked. Because it is a crazy idea, he said. One child is bad enough. There is no way I would take on a second. Besides, he is human. I'm stuck with you because of the vampire blood in your veins. Why should I put my neck out on the line for a human? He's my friend, I said. He'd be company for me. Mr. Crutchley snorted. <laughs> Madame Octa is company enough. That's not the same, I whined. Tell me this, Mr. Crutchley mused. What happens when he finds out you are a vampire? You think you will understand? You think you will sleep easily? knowing his best friend would be like nothing better than to slit his throat open and drink him dry. I wouldn't do that, I yelled. I know, Mr. Crutchley agreed, but I am a vampire. I know what you are really like. So does Mr. Tall, Evra, and the others. But how do you think an ordinary human would see you? I sighed unhappily. So you won't let him join? Mr. Krebsley began to shake his head, then stopped and nodded slowly. <sighs> Very well, he said. He can join. He can? I stared at him, shocked. Even though I'd been arguing on Sam's behalf, I'd never really thought they would let him join. Yes, Mr. Krebsley said. He can join and travel with us and help you and ever with your jobs. But on one condition... Mr. Krebsley leaned in close and treated me to his wickedest grin. He has to become a half vampire too, he hissed.
Chapter 25 My heart was heavy when I saw Sam trotting to camp early the next morning. I hated having to disappoint him, but I knew I had to. There was no way I could let Mr. Cressley turn Sam into a half-vampire. I thought about it a lot during the night, and the frightening thing was, I believed Sam would agree to becoming a half-vampire if I gave him the option. Smart as he was, I don't think he would have stopped to consider the loneliness and awfulness of being a vampire. He rushed over when he saw me, too excited to take any notice of my change of costume and haircut. Did you ask him? Did you? His face was bright, filled with hope. Yes, I said, smiling. I said, smiling sadly. And? I shook my head. <sighs> Sorry, Sam. He said no. Sam's face fell about a thousand kilometers. Why? He shouted. You're too young, I said. You're not much older, he snapped. <clears throat> but I have no parents, I lied. I had no home to call my own when I joined the sick. I don't care about my parents, he sniffed. That's not true, I said. You'd miss them. Are you going home for holidays? It wouldn't work. You're not cut out for the life in the sick to freak. Maybe later, when you're older. I don't care about later, he yelled. I want to join now. I worked hard. I've proved myself. I've kept quiet when you were lying to, to RV about the wolfman yesterday. Did you tell that to Mr. Tall? I told him everything, I sighed. I don't believe you, Sam said. I don't think you spoke to him at all. I want to see him myself. I shrugged and pointed towards Mr. Tall's van. That's where you'll find him, I said. Sam set off in a huff, but slowed after a few steps, then came to a halt. He stopped the ground miserably with his toes, then returned and sat down beside me. It's not fair, he grumbled. I could see tears trickling down his cheeks. I'd made up my mind to join. I was going to be great. I had it all planned. There'll be other chances, I said. When? he asked. I never heard of a freak show playing around here before. When would I run into one again? I didn't answer. You wouldn't have liked it anyway, I said. It's not as much fun as you think. Imagine what it's like in the middle of winter, when you have to get up at five in the morning and wash in ice cold water and work outside in freezing blizzards. That doesn't bother me, Sam insisted. Then his tears stopped and he got a crafty look in his eyes. Maybe I'll come along anyway, he said. Maybe I'll sneak into one of the vans and stow away with you. Mr. Tall will have to take me then. You can't do that, I snapped. You mustn't. I will if I want, he grinned. You can't stop me. I can, I growled. How, he sneered. I took a deep breath. The time had come to frighten Sam Grest away forever. I couldn't tell him the truth about me, but I could invent a story almost as frightening. One guaranteed to send him running. I never told you what happens to my parents, did I, Sam? Or how I come to join the freak show? I kept my voice low and steady. No, Sam said quietly. I often wondered, but I didn't want to ask. I killed them, Sam, I said. What? His face went white. I go crazy sometimes, like the wolf man. Nobody knows when it's going to happen or why. I was in a hospital when I was younger, but I seem to be getting better. My parents brought me home for Christmas. After dinner, while I was playing a cracker with Dad, I flipped. I tore him to pieces. Mum tried to drag me off, but I killed her too. My little sister ran for help, but I caught her. I ripped her apart the same way I ripped the cracker in two. Then, after I killed them, I locked eyes with Sam. It had to be a good act to make him believe. I ate them. 
He stared at me, stunned. That's not true, he whispered. It can't be. I killed and ate them, then ran away. I lied. I was discovered by Mr. Tall, who agreed to hide me. They have a special cage built to keep me in when I go mad. The problem is, nobody knows when it's going to happen. That's why most people avoid me. Everett's okay because he's strong. So are some of the other performers. But in ordinary humans, I could kill them in the blink of an eye. You're lying, Sam said. I picked up a large stick which was laying nearby, turned it around in my hands, then put it in my mouth and bit through it as if it was a big carrot. I chew your bones and spit you out as gristle, I told Sam. I cut my lips in the stick and the blood made me look like a fright. You wouldn't be able to stop me. You'd be sleeping in my tent if you joined the show and you'd be the one I'd go for first. You can't join the sick, you freak, I said. I wish you could. I'd love to have a friend, but it's not possible. I'd end up killing you if you joined. Sam tried responding, but he couldn't get his mouth to work. He believed my far-fetched tale. He'd seen enough of the show to know that such things could happen here. Go away, Sam, I said sadly. Go away and don't ever come back. It's safer this way. It's better for both of us. Darren, I, I, his head shook uncertainly. Go! I roared and pounded the ground with my hands. I bared my teeth and growled. I was able to make my voice much deeper than a human's, so it sounded like a wild animal. Sam yelped, scrambled to his feet, and sprinted for the cover of the trees, never once looking back. I watched him go, heavy-hearted, certain my ploy had worked. He would never be back. I would see him no more. Our paths had separated, and we would never meet again. If I'd known how wrong I was, if I had any idea of the dreadful night which lay ahead, I'd have sped on after him and never returned to that foul circus of blood. That dreadful circus of death. Chapter 26. I was moping around when one of the little people tapped me on the back. It was the one with the limp. What do you want? I asked. The tiny man, if it was a man, in the blue hooded crobes, rubbed his belly with his hands. This was a sign that he and his brothers were hungry. But he just had breakfast, I said. He rubbed his belly again. It's too early for dinner. He rubbed his belly again. I knew that this would go on for hours if I let it. He would patiently follow me around, rubbing his belly, until I agreed to go hunt for him. <sighs> All right, I snapped. I'll see what I can find. But I'm on my own today, so if I don't come back with a full bag, tough. He rubbed his belly again. I snorted and set off. I shouldn't have gone hunting. I was very weak. I could still run quicker than a human, and I was stronger than most kids my age. But I wasn't super fit or extra strong any longer. Mr. Crepsley had said I would be dead within a week if I didn't drink human blood, and I knew he'd spoken the truth. I could feel myself wasting away. A few more days, and I wouldn't be able to pull myself out of bed. I tried catching a rabbit, but I wasn't fast enough. I worked up a sweat chasing it, and I had to sit down there for a few minutes. Next, I went looking for roadkill, but I couldn't find any dead animals. Finally, because I was tired and half afraid of what would happen if I returned to camp empty-handed, little people might decide to eat me, I headed for a field full of sheep. They were grazing peacefully when I arrived. They were used to humans and barely lifted their heads when I entered the field and walked among them. I was looking for an old sheep, one that looked sick. That way I didn't feel so lousy about killing it. I eventually found one with skinny, trembling legs and a dazed expression and decided she'd do. 
She looked as though she hadn't long lived to, li to live anyway. If I'd had my full powers, I'd have snapped her neck and she would have been dead in an instant without any pain. But I was weak and clumsy and didn't twist hard enough the first time. The sheep began to bleat with agony. She tried running away, but her legs wouldn't carry her. She fell to the ground where she lay, bleating unhappily. I tried breaking her neck again, but couldn't. In the end, I fetched a stone and finished the job. It was a messy, horrible way to kill an animal, and I felt ashamed of myself as I grabbed its back legs and hauled it away from the flock. I'd almost reached the fence before I realized somebody was sitting on top of it, waiting for me. I dropped the sheep and looked up, expecting an angry farmer. But it wasn't a farmer. It was RV. And he was mad as hell. How could you? He shouted. How could you kill a poor innocent animal in so cruel a manner? I tried killing her quickly, I said. I tried snapping her neck, but I couldn't. But I left her when he failed, but she was in pain. Thought it was better to finish her off and leave her to suffer. That's real big of you, man, he said sarcastically. Do you think you'll get a Nobel Peace Prize for that? Please, RV, I said. Don't be angry. She was sick. The farmer would have killed her anyway. Even if she lived, she would have been sent to a butcher's in the end. That don't make it right, he said angrily. Just because other people are nasty doesn't mean you should be nasty too. Killing animals isn't nasty, I said. No one is for food. What's wrong with vegetables, he said. We don't need to eat meat, man. We don't need to kill. Some people need meat, I disagreed. Some can't live without it. Then they should be left to die, RV roared. That sheep never did anything to anyone. As far as I'm concerned, killing her is worse than killing a human. You're a murderer, Darren Shan. I shook my head sadly. There was no point arguing with somebody this stubborn. RV had his way of looking at the world, and I had mine. Look, RV, I said, I don't enjoy killing. I'd be over the moon if everyone in the world was vegetarian, but they're not. People eat meat, and that's a fact of life. I'm only doing what I have to. Well, we'll see what the police have to say about it, RV said. Police? I frowned. What do they have to do with it? You've killed somebody else's sheep, he laughed cruelly. Do you think they'll let you get away with that? They won't arrest you for murdering rapids and foxes. More's the pity. But they'll charge you for killing a sheep. They'll have the, I'll have the police and health inspectors down on you like a ton of bricks, he grinned. You won't, I gasped. You don't like the police. You're always fighting against them. When I have to, he agreed. But when I can get them on my side, he laughed again. They'll arrest you first, then turn your camp upside down. I've been studying the goings on there. I've seen the way you treat that poor hairy man. The wolf man? Yes. You keep him locked away like an animal. Because he is an animal, I said. No, Arvi disagreed. You are the animal man. Arvi, listen, I said. We don't have to be enemies. Come back to camp with me. I'll talk to Mr. Tall and the others. See how we live. Get to know and understand us. There's no need to... Save it, he snapped. I'm going for the police, and nothing you can say will stop me. I took a deep breath. I liked RV, but I knew I couldn't allow him to destroy the sick freak. Very well, I said. If nothing I say can stop you, maybe you'll respond to something I'll do. Summoning all my remaining strength, I threw the dead body of the sheep at RV. It struck him in the chest and knocked him flying from the fence. He yelled with surprise, then with pain as he landed heavily on the ground. I leapt over the fence and was on him before he could move. How did you do that, man? He gasped. Never mind that, I snapped. Kids can't throw sheep, he said. How did... Shut up, I shouted and slapped his bearded face. He stared up at me, shocked. Listen, Reggie Veggie, I growled, using the same, using the name he hated. 
and listen well, you won't go to the police or the health people. Because if you do, this sheep won't be the only dead body I drag back to the sick to freak today. What are you? He asked. His voice was trembling and his eyes were filled with terror. I'm the end of you if you cross me, I swore. Then dug my fingernails into the soil at either side of his face and squeezed his head between my hands just enough to let him know how strong I was. Get out of here, Reggie, I said. Come find your friends in NOP. Stick to protesting against new roads and bridges. You're in over your head here. Me and my friends in the sick are freaks, and freaks don't obey the same laws as other people. You understand? You're crazy, he said softly. Yes, I sighed but not as crazy as you'll be if you stay and interfere. I stood and draped, the, and draped the sheep over my shoulders. Going to the police would be useless anyway, I said. By the time they reach the camp, this sheep will be long gone, bones and all. You can do what you like, RV. Stay or go. Report me to the police or keep your mouth shut. It's up to you. All I've left to say, all I've left to say is this. To me and my kind, you're no different than this sheep. I gave it a shake. We think no more of killing you than we would any dumb animal of the fields. You're a monster, RV gasped. Yes, I agreed. But I'm only a baby monster. You should see what some of the others are like. I smiled nastily at him, hating myself for acting so mean, but knowing this was the way it had to be. So long, Reggie Veggie, I said, and walked away. I didn't look back. I didn't need to. I could hear the chattering of his terrified teeth practically all the way back to camp. <clears throat> Chapter 27. This time, I went straight to Mr. Tall and told him about RV. He listened carefully and then said, You handled him well. I did what I had to, I replied. I'm not proud of it. I don't like bullying or scaring people, but there was no other way. By rights, you should have killed him, Mr. Tor said. That way he could do us no harm whatsoever. I'm not a murderer, I told him. I know, he sighed. Nor am I. It's a pity one of the little people wasn't with you. They'd have chopped his head off without a second's hesitation. What do you think we should do? I asked. I don't think he can cause many problems, Mr. Tall mused. He'll probably be too scared to go to the police straight away. Even if he does, there's no evidence against you. It would be an unwanted complication but we've had plenty of dealings with officers of the law in the past. We could cope. The health authorities would worry me more. We could hit the road and lose them, but people in the health department tend to trail you around like hound dogs once they've got your scent. We'll leave tomorrow, he decided. There's a show scheduled for tonight, and I hate cancelling on short notice. Dawn is the earliest any health inspector could be here, so we'll break camp before then. You're not angry with me? I asked. No, he said. This isn't the first time we've clashed with the public. You are not to blame. I helped Mr. Tor spread word of our departure among the camp. Everybody took it in their stride. Most seemed happy to be getting this much notice. They often had to move on with only an hour or two in morning. It was another busy day for me. As well as preparing for the show, I had to help people get ready for leaving. I offered to help Truska pack her belongings, but her tent was already bare when I got there. She only winked when I asked how she'd pack so quickly. I told Mr. Krebsley about her morning departure when he woke. He didn't seem surprised. We have been here long enough, he said. I asked to be left out of that night's show because I wasn't feeling very well. I'll get to bed early. I said, and have a long sleep. It will not do any good, Mr. Krebsley warned. 
There is only one thing that will make you feel better, and you know what that is. Night rolled on, and soon it was time for the show to begin. There was another big crowd. The roads were blocked with cars in both directions. Everybody in the seat was busy, either preparing to go on stage, or getting people seated, or selling stuff. The only two who seemed to have nothing to do with me and Evra, who wasn't before me because of his old snake. He left her for a few minutes to watch the start of the show. We stood to one side of the stage as Mr. Tall got the ball rolling and introduced the Wolfman. We stuck around until the first break, then strolled outside and studied the stars. I'll miss this place when we move on, Evra said. I like the countryside. You can't see the stars so well in a city. I didn't know you were interested in astronomy, I said. I'm not, he replied, but I enjoy looking up at the stars. I got dizzy after a while and had to sit down. You're not feeling too good, are you? Ever asked. I smiled weakly. I've been better. Still not drinking human blood? I shook my head. He sat beside me. You never told me exactly why you won't drink it, he said. Surely it can't be so different to animal blood. I don't know, I said. And I don't want to find out. I paused. I'm afraid that if I drink human blood, I'll be evil. Mr. Crepsley says vampires aren't evil, but I think they are. I think anyone who looks at humans as if they're animals must be evil. But if it's to keep you alive, Evra said. And that's how I would start, I said. I tell myself I was going to keep... I tell myself I was doing it to keep going. I'd swear never to drink more than I needed. But what if I couldn't stop myself? I need more as I grow older and larger. What if I can't control my thirst? What if I kill someone? I don't think you could, Evra said. You're not evil, Darren. I don't think a good person can do evil things. As long as you treat human blood like medicine, you'll be all right. Maybe, I said, though I didn't want to believe it. Anyway, I'm okay for the time being. I don't have to make a final decision for a couple of more days. Would you really let yourself die rather than drink? Ever asked. I don't know, I answered honestly. I'd miss you if you died, Ever said sadly. Well, I said uncomfortably. Maybe it won't come to that. Maybe there's some other way I can survive. A way that Mr. Crepsley doesn't want to tell me about until he has no other choice. Ever grunted. He knew as well as me there was no other way. I'm going to check on my snake, he said. Do you want to come with and sit for us a while? No, I said. I better get some sleep. We'll have to rise early, and I'm exhausted. We said our good night and parted. I didn't head straight for Mr. Crefty's tent, but wandered through the campsite, thinking about my conversation with Ever, wondering what it would feel like to die. I died once before and been buried, but that wasn't the same thing. If I died for real, I'd be dead for good. Life would be over. My body would decay. And then I glanced up at the stars. Was that where I'd be heading? To the other side of the universe? Vampire paradise? It was a troubling time. When I was living at home, I'd hardly ever thought about death. It was something that only happened to old people. Now here I was, almost face to face with it. If only somebody else could decide for me. I should be worrying about school and making the local football team, not worrying about whether I should drink human blood or let myself die. It wasn't fair. I was too young. I shouldn't have to... I saw a shadow passing in front of the nearby tent, but took little notice of it. It wasn't until I heard a sharp snapping sound that I wonder who it might have been. Nobody should be out here. Everyone involved with the show was in the big tent. Was it somebody from the audience? I decided to investigate. I headed in the direction that the shadow had taken. It was a dark night, and after a few turns, I couldn't figure out which way the person had gone. I was on the verge of abandoning the search 
when I heard another sharp snapping sound, closer this time. A quick look around convinced me of my location, and I knew immediately where the sounds must have come from. The Wolfman's cage. Taking a deep breath to steady my nerves, I put my best foot forward and hurried to check it out. <clears throat> Chapter 28. The grass was damp, so it bent beneath my feet and made no sound. When I reached the last caravan before the wolfman's cage, I paused and listened. There was a soft jangling sound, as though heavy chains were being slightly shaken. I stepped out from under cover. There were dim lights at the other side of the wolfman's cage, so I was able to see everything in perfect detail. He'd been wheeled back here after his act, and he was heavy, and he wa as he was every night. There was a slab of meat in his cage, which normally he'd be feasting on, but not tonight. Tonight, he was focused on something different. There was a large man in front of the wolfman's cage. He had a huge pair of pliers with him, and they cut some of the chains which are holding the door shut. The man was trying to unwrap the chains, but wasn't enjoying much success. He cursed softly to himself and lifted the pliers to cut through another link. What are you doing? I shouted. The man jumped with shock, dropped the pliers and spun around. It was, as I guessed, RV. He looked guilty and scared at first, but when he saw I was alone, he grew in confidence. Stay back, he warned. What are you doing? I asked again. Freeing this poor creature, he said. I wouldn't keep the wildest of animals in a cage like this. It's inhuman. I'm letting him go. I rang the police. They'll be out here in the morning. But I decided to do a bit of work of my own beforehand. You can't do that, I gasped. Are you crazy? That guy's savage. He'd kill everything with a five kilometer radius if you let him out. So you say, RV sneered. I don't believe that. If... It's been my experience that animals react according to how they're treated. If you treat them like mad monsters, they'll act that way. If, on the other hand, you treat them with respect, love, and humanity, you don't know what you're doing, I told him. The wolfman isn't like other animals. Come away from that before you do any real damage. We can talk this over. We can... No, he screamed. I'm through talking. He spun back to the chains and began struggling with them again. He ran... He reached into the cage and tucked the thickest chains through the bars. The wolfman watched him silently. RV, stop! I shouted and raced over to prevent him opening the door. I grabbed his shoulders and tried pulling him away, but I wasn't strong enough. I punched him in the ribs a few times, but he only grunted and doubled his efforts. I grabbed for his hands to prise them off the chains, but the bars were in the way. Leave me alone! RV yelled. He turned to... He turned his head to address me directly. His eyes were wild. You won't stop me, he screeched. You won't prevent me from doing my duty. I'll free this victim. I'll see justice done. I'll... He stopped ranting all of a sudden. His face turned deathly white, and his body shuddered, then went stiff. There was a crunching, munching, ripping sound. And when I looked inside the cage... I realized the wolfman had made his move. He'd sprung across the cage while we were arguing, grabbed both of RV's arms, jammed them into his mouth, and bitten them off beneath the elbows. RV fell away from the cage, shocked. He lifted his shortened arms and watched his blood pump from the holes at the ends of his elbows. I tried snatching the lower arms of it back from the mouth of the wolfman. If I could retrieve him, they could be stuck back on, but he moved too quickly for me, let back out of reach, and began chewing. Within seconds, the arms were a mess, and I knew they'd be no good again. Where are my hands? Avi asked. I switched my attention back to the bearded man. He was staring at the stumps that were his arms, a funny look on his face, not yet feeling the pain that must surely come. Where are my hands? He asked again. They're gone. They were there a minute ago. Where did all this blood come from? Why can't I see the bone inside my skin? Where are my hands? He screamed this last question at the top of his voice. 
You have to come with me, I said, drawing near. We have to get your arms seen to before you bleed to death. You stay away from me, Avi yelled. He tried raising her hands to shove me back, then remembered he didn't have hands anymore. You're responsible for this, he shouted. You did this to me. No, Avi, it was the wolf man, I said, but he wasn't listening. This is your fault, he insisted. You took my hands. You're an evil little monster and you stole my hands. My hands. My hands. He began screaming again. I reached for him this time, as he, but he brushed me aside, turned and ran. He tore screaming. He tore screaming through the camp, his blood-drenched half-arms raised above his head, yelling as loudly as he could until he vanished into the night. My hands! My hands! My hands! I wanted to run after him, but I was afraid he might attack me. I set off to find Mr. Krebsley and Mr. Tall. They knew what to do, but I was stopped dead in my tracks by a worrying growl behind me. I turned slowly. The wolfman was at the door of his cage, which was swinging wide open. He'd somehow removed the last of the chains and freed himself. I remained perfectly still as he stood and grinned viciously, his long, sharp teeth glinting in the dim light. He looked to the left and right, stretched out his hands and grabbed the bars to either side. Then he crouched down low and tensed his legs. He sprang, propelling himself towards me. I shut my eyes and waited for the end to come. I heard and felt him land about a meter in front of me. I began to say my final prayers. But then I heard him flying overhead and realized he bounced over me. For a couple of terrifying seconds, I waited for his teeth to bite through the back of my neck and gnaw my head off, but they didn't. Confused, I turned, blinking. He was racing away from me. I glimpsed a figure ahead of him, running quickly between the caravans, and understood he was after somebody else. He passed me up for a fit in favor of a tastier meal. I took several stumbling steps after the parting wolfman. I was smiling and silently thanking the gods. I couldn't believe how close I'd come to death. When he leapt through the air, I was sure. My feet struck something and I stopped. I looked down and saw a bag. The person the wolfman was chasing must have dropped it. And for the first time, I wonder who the wild wolfman was after. I picked up the bag. It was the sort you carry over one shoulder. It was full of clothes, which I could feel through the covers. A small jar fell out as it turned the bag around. Retrieving it, I thumbed up the lid and caught the bitter aroma of pickled onions. My heart almost stopped. Furiously, I began searching for a name tag, praying the pickled onions didn't mean what I feared. My prayers went unanswered. The handwriting, when I found it, was neat but unjoined. The writing of a child. This bag is the property of Sam Grest, it said, and his address was just beneath. Hands off, it warned at the end, which was quite ironic given what had happened a minute or so earlier with RV. But I hadn't time to laugh at the dark joke. Sam! For some reason, he'd snuck out here tonight, probably to stow away with the sick, and must have seen and followed me. It was Sam, the wolfman's beady eyes had spotted, standing behind me. It was Sam running for his life through the camp. The wolfman was after Sam. Chapter 29. I shouldn't have pursued them on my own. I should have gone for help. It was madness, rushing off into the darkness by myself. But he was after Sam. Sam who wanted to join the sick. Sam who wanted to be my blood brother. Harmless, friendly, long-winded Sam. The boy who had saved my life. I didn't think about my own safety. Sam was in trouble, and there wasn't time to seek the help of others. It might prove the death of me, but I have to go after them to try and save Sam. I owed him. I cleared the camp quickly. The clouds had parted overhead, and I spotted the wolfman disappearing into the trees. I hurried after him, running as fast as I could. 
I heard the wolfman howl a while later, which was a good sign. If many were still chasing Sam, if he caught him, he'd be too busy eating to howl. I wonder why he hadn't caught him yet. He should have. Though I guess I'd never seen him running in the open, I was sure he must be fast. Perhaps he was playing with Sam, toying with him before he moved in for the kill. The footprints were clear in the damp night earth. But I would have been able to follow them from the sounds in any case. I had to run silently through a forest, especially at night. We ran in that fashion for several minutes. Sam and the wolfman far in front and out of sight, me trailing behind. My legs were beginning to tire, but I forced myself on. I thought about what I would do when I caught up. There was no way I could beat the wolfman in a fair fight. Perhaps I could slam him over the head with a stick or something, but it was unlikely. He was strong and fast, and had the taste of human blood. He would be pretty much unstoppable. The most I could hope to do was throw myself in his path and take Sam's place. If I offered myself instead of Sam, maybe he'd take me and Sam could escape. I wouldn't mind dying for Sam. I'd given up my humanity for one friend. I wasn't asking so much to give up my life for another. Besides, this way, if I died, it would be for a good cause. I'd no longer have to worry about drinking human blood or starving to death. I could go down fighting. After a few more minutes, I burst into a clearing and realized where Sam had led us, the old deserted railway station. It showed he was still thinking clearly. This was the best place to come, with plenty of hiding spots and lots of stuff, chunks of metal and glass to use in a fight. Maybe neither of us would have to die. Maybe there was a chance we could win this battle. I saw the wolfman pause in the middle of the station yard and sniffed the air. He howled again, a loud, spine-shivering howl, then set off towards one of the rusty carriages. I ran around the back of the carriage, moving as quietly as I could. I listened for sounds when I got there, but I couldn't hear anything. I lifted myself up and looked in one of the carriage windows. Nothing. I lowered myself and slid along to the third window over. Again, I could see nothing when I looked inside. I was lifting myself to peep in the next window when I blimped the metal bar, shot moving towards my face at high speed. I twisted aside just in time to avoid it. It whistled by the side of my face, scratching me, but not doing any serious damage. Sam, stop, it's me! I hissed, dropping to the ground. There was silence for a moment, then Sam's face appeared in the round window. Darren! He asked. What are you doing here? I followed you, I said. I thought you were the wolf man. I was trying to kill you. You nearly did. I'm sorry. For God's sake, Sam, don't waste time apologizing. I snapped. We're in big trouble. We have to put our thinking caps on. Get out of here quick. He retreated from the window. There were soft shuffling sounds. Then he appeared out of the carriage door. He checked to make sure the wolfman wasn't around, jumped down, and crept over to meet me. Where is he? Sam asked. I don't know, I whispered. He's around somewhere, though. I saw him coming in this direction. Maybe you found something else to attack, Sam suggested, hopefully. A sheep or a cow? I wouldn't bet on it, I grunted. He wouldn't have run all this way just to abandon the chase at the very end. We huddled close together, Sam covering the right with his Sam covering the right with his eyes, me the left. I could feel his body trembling, and I'm sure he could feel mine shaking too. What are we gonna do? Sam asked. I don't know, I replied. Any ideas? A few, he said. We could lead him to the guard's house. He might fall through one of the rotten fold boards. We could trap him down there. Maybe, I said. But what if we fall through as well? We'd be trapped for sure. He could jump down and eat us whenever he liked. How about the rafters? Sam asked. We could climb out into the middle of the rafter and hang on back to back. We could take clubs or sticks with us and beat him off if he attacked. There'd only be one way for him to come up with, to come at us up there. And somebody's sure to arrive from the Seek to Freak sooner or later, I said, thinking it over. 
But what if he decides to snap after the rafter of one end? They sit fairly deep into the brick, Sam said. I don't think he could break them with his bare hands. Would a rafter hold the three of us? I asked. Um, not sure, Sam admitted. But at least if we fell from that height, it'd be over quickly. Who knows, we might get lucky and fall on the wolfman. He could cushion our fall and get killed in the process. I laughed sickly. <laughs> You've been watching too many cartoons. But it's a good idea. Better than any I can think of. It won't be easy to fend him off, even on a rafter. But it'll make it harder for him to get to us. How long do you think it'll be before the people from the sick get here? Sam asked. It depends on when they realize what's happening, I said. If we're lucky, they'll have heard him howling. It might be in a couple of minutes. Otherwise, we might have to sit and wait until the end of the show, which could be another hour, maybe longer. Do you have a weapon? Sam asked. No, I said. I don't have time to pick anything up. He handed me a short iron bar. Here, he said. I had this for backup. It's not very good, but it's better than nothing. Any sign of the wolfman? I asked. No, he said. Not yet. We better get going before he arrives, I said, then paused. How are we going to get out of the station house? It's a long run and the wolfman could be hiding anywhere along the way. We'll have to race for it and hope for the best, Sam said. Will we split it up? I asked. I'd rather not, he said. I think it would be better off together. I agree. Are you ready to start? Give me a few seconds, he said. I turned and watched him breathing. His face was white and his clothes were torn and dirty from running through the woods, but he looked ready for business. He was a tough little character. Why didn't you come back tonight, Sam? I asked softly. To join the sick de freak, he answered. Even after everything I told you about me? I decided to risk it, he said. I mean, you're a friend. We have to stick by our friends, don't we? Your story made me more determined to join once I recovered from my initial fright. I might have been able to help you. I've read books about personality disorders. Maybe I could have cured you. I couldn't help grinning. <laughs> You're a moron, Sam Grest, I said. I know, he smiled. So are you. That's why you'll make a good pair. If we get out of this, I told him, feel free to join up. And you don't have to worry about me eating you. That's just a story to frighten you off. Really? He asked. Really? I said. Phew. You right this brow. I can rest easy now. You can if the wolfman doesn't get us, I agreed. Ready yet? I'm ready. He hitched up his trousers and prepared to run. On the count of three, he said. Okay, I replied. One, he began. We faced in the direction of the guard's house. Two, we got into sprint start positions. Three, before he could finish, a pair of hairy hands darted out from underneath the carriage where I realized too late, the wolfman was hiding. The fingers wrapped around Sam's lower legs, grabbed him by the ankles, and dragged him to the ground. Chapter 30 Sam started to scream as soon as the hands tightened on his ankles. The fall knocked the breath out of him, silencing him momentarily, but after a second or two, he was back screaming again. I fell to my knees, grabbed Sam's arms, and pulled. I could see the wolfman underneath the carriage, spread out on his hairy belly, grinning wildly. Drool was dripping from his jaws. I tucked hard, and Sam slid towards me, but the wolfman came with him, wriggling out from under the carriage, not loosening his grip. I stopped pulling and let go of Sam. I grabbed the long iron bar which he'd dropped, jumped to my feet, and began pounding on the outstretched arms of the wolfman, who howled angrily. The wolfman released one of his hairy paws and swatted at me. I ducked out of the way, and struck with the hand still holding Sam. The wolfman yelped with pain, and the fingers came free. Run! I screamed to Sam as I yanked him to his feet. We set off towards the guard's house, side by side. I could hear the wolfman scrabbling out from underneath the carriage. He'd been playing with us before, 
but now he was furious. I knew he'd come at us with everything he had. The games were over. There was no way we'd make the shelter of the guard's house. He'd have us before we keep, he'd have us before we were halfway across the yard. <laughs> keep running, I gasped to Sam, then stop and turn to me to have the charge of the oncoming wolfman. My actions took him by surprise and he ran into me. His body was hairy and sweaty and heavy. The collision sent both of us flying up to, flying to the floor. Our arms and legs were all tangled up, but I quickly freed myself and whacked him with the bar. The wolfman roared angrily and swiped at my arm. This time, he connected, just below where it joined with my shoulder. The force of the blow deadened my arm, which became a useless lump of flesh and bone. I dropped the bar, then reached for it with my good left hand, but the wolfman was quicker. He snatched up the bar and tossed it away, where it fell with a clang, lost to the darkness. He stood slowly, grinning nastily. I could read the expression in his eyes and knew that if he could speak, he would be saying something like, Now, Darren Shan, you're mine. You had your fun and games, but now it's killing time. He grabbed my body by the sides, opened his mouth wide, and leant forward to bite my face off. I could smell from the stench of his breath and see bits of meat and shirt from RV's arms stuck in between his yellowish teeth. Before he could snap his, uh, his jaw shut, something hit the side of his head and knocked him off balance. I glimpsed Sam behind him, a heavy chunk of wood in his hands. He hit the wolfman again, this time causing his hands to loosen. One good turn deserves another, Sam yelled, slamming the wood into the wolfman for a third time. Come on, we have to... I never heard Sam's next words, because as I started towards him, the wolfman lashed out blindly with one of his fists. It was a wild shot, but he got lucky and slammed right into my face, knocking me backwards. My head almost exploded. I saw bright lights and huge stars, then slumped to the ground in a faint. When I recovered a few seconds or minutes later, I'm not sure how much time had passed. The railway station was eerily quiet. I could hear nobody running or screaming or fighting. All I could hear was a steady munching sound a little way ahead of me. Munch, munch, munch. I sat up slowly, ignoring the hammering pain in my head. It took my eyes a few seconds to readjust to the darkness. When I could see again, I realized I was gazing at the back of the wolfman. He was crouched on all fours, head bent over something. He was the one making the mounting sounds. The dizziness from the punch made it took me a while to realize it wasn't some thing he was eating. It was someone. Sam! I scrambled to my feet, pain forgotten, and rushed forward. But one look at the bloody mess beneath the wolfman, and I knew it was too late. No! I screamed and punched the wolfman with my one good hand, attacking senselessly. He grunted and shoved me away. I sprang back and this time kicked as well as punched. He growled and tried shoving again, but I held on and pulled his ears and pulled his hair and ears. He howled then and finally lifted his mouth. It was red. It was a it was red, a dark, dreadful red, full of guts and blood and bits of flesh and bone. He rolled on top of me, forcing me down and pinned me with one long hairy arm. His head shot back and he howled up at the night sky. Then, with a demonic snarl, he drove his teeth towards my throat, meaning to finish me off with one quick bite. Chapter 31. At almost the last possible moment, a pair of hands appeared out of the darkness and grabbed the wolfman's jaw, halting his plunge. The hands twisted the head to one side, causing the wolfman to shriek and fall off me. His attacker climbed onto his back and held him down. I saw fists flying faster than my eyes could follow, and then the wolfman was lying unconscious on the ground. His attacker stood and pulled me to my feet. I found myself gazing up at the flushed, scarred face of Mr. Krebsley. 
I came as soon as I could. The vampire gasped, turning my head gently to the left and right, examining the damage. Ever heard the howls of the wolf man? He did not know about you and the boy. He just thought the creature had burst free. Ever told Mr. Tall, who canceled the rest of the show and organized a search party. Then I thought of you. When I saw your bed was empty, I scouted around and found your trail. I thought I was going to die. I moaned, finding it hard to speak. I was bruised all over, suffering from the shock. I was certain. I thought nobody would come. I... I threw my good arm around Mr. Krebsley and hugged him hard. Thank you, I sobbed. Thank you, thank you, thank I stopped, remembering my fallen friend. Sam! I screamed. I let go of Mr. Krebsley and rushed to where the boy was lying. The wolfman had Tom Sands barely open and eaten a lot of his insides. Amazingly, Sam was still alive when I got to him. His eyelids were fluttering and he was breathing lightly. Sam, are you okay? I asked. It was a stupid question, but the one went, but the only one my battered lips could form. Sam? I brushed his forehead with my fingers, but he showed no signs of hearing or feeling me. He looked quite peaceful, from the chest up at least. Mr. Krebsley knelt down bes beside me and checked the body. Can you save him? I asked. He shook his head slowly. You must, I shouted. You can close the wounds. We can call a doctor. You can give him a potion. There must be some way to... Darren, he said softly. There is nothing we can do. He is dying. The damage is too great. Another couple of minutes and... He sighed. At least he's beyond feeling. There will be no pain. No! I screamed and threw myself onto Sam. I was crying bitterly, sobbing so hard it hurt. Sam, you can't die, Sam. Stay alive. You can join the circuit and travel with us all over the world. You could... You... I could say no more, only lower my head, cling to Sam, and weep. In the deserted old railway yard, the wolfman lay unconscious to my rear. Mr. Crapsley sat silently by my side. Beneath me, Sam Grest, who had been my friend and saved my life, remained perfectly still and slipped further and further into the final sleep of an untimely, horrible death. Chapter 32 after a while, I felt a slight tugging at the sleeve of my arm. I looked around. Mr. Crutchley was standing over me, looking miserable. Darren, he said, it will not seem like the right time, but there is something you must do for Sam's sake and your own. What are you talking about? I wiped some of the tears from my face and stared up at him. Can we save him? Tell me if we can, I'll do anything. There is nothing we can do to save his body, Mr. Krebsley told me. He is dying, and nothing can change that. But there is something we can do for his spirit. Darren, he said, you must drink Sam's blood. I went on staring at him, but now it was a stare of disbelief, not hope. Could you? I asked softly. One of my best friends is dying, and all you can think about... You're sick! You're a sick, twisted monster! You should be dying, not Sam! I hate you! Get out of here! You do not understand, he said. Yes, I do! I screamed. Sam's dying, but all you're worried about is blooding me! Do you know where you are? You're a no good. 
Do you remember our discussion about vampires being able to absorb a part of a person's spirits? He asked. I've been about to call him something awful, but his question confused me. What's that got to do with this? I asked. Darren, this is important. Do you remember? Yes, I said softly. What about it? Sam is dying, Mr. Redley said. A few more minutes and he will be gone forever. But you can keep part of him alive within you if you drink from him now and take his life before the wounds of the wolf man can. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. You want me to kill Sam? I screamed. No, he sighed. Sam has already been killed. But if you finish him off before he dies from the bite of the wolf man, you will save some of his memories and feelings. In you, he can live on. I shook my head. I can't drink his blood, I whispered. Not Sam's. I glanced down at the small savage body. I can't. Mr. Crepsley sighed. I will not force you to, he said, but think carefully about it. What happened tonight is a tragedy which will haunt you for a very long time. But if you drink from Sam and absorb part of his essence, dealing with his death will be easier. Losing a loved one is hard. This way, you need not lose all of him. I can't drink from him, I sobbed. He was my friend. It is because he was your friend that you must, Mr. Krebsley said, then turned away and left me to decide. I stared down at Sam. He looked so lifeless, as though he'd already lost that which made him human, alive, unique. I thought of his jokes and long words and hopes and dreams and how awful it would be if all of that simply vanished with his passing. Kneeling, I placed the fingers of my left hand on Sam's red neck. I'm sorry, Sam, I moaned, then dug my sharp nails into his soft flesh, leant forward, and stuck my mouth over the holes they made. Blood gushed, and it made me gag. I nearly fell away, but with an effort, I held my place and gulped it down. His blood was hot and salty, and ran down my throat like thick, creamy butter. Sam's pulse slowed as I drank, then stopped. But I went on drinking, swallowing every last drop, absorbing. When I'd finally sucked him dry, I turned away and howled at the sky like the wolfman had. For a long time, that's all I could do. Howl and scream and cry like the wild animal of the night, which I'd become. <clears throat> Chapter 33. Mr. Tall and a handful of others from the Cirque de Freak, including four little people, arrived a bit later. I was sitting by Sam's side, too tired to howl anymore, staring blankly into space, feeling his blood settle on my stomach. What's the story? Mr. Tall asked Mr. Krebsley. How did the wolf man get free? I do not know, Hibernius, Mr. Krebsley replied. I have not asked, and I do not intend to. Not for a night or two, at least. Darren is in no fit shape for an interrogation. Is the wolf man dead? Mr. Tall asked. No, Mr. Krebsley said. I merely knocked him out. Thank heaven for small mercies, Mr. Tall sighed. He clicked his fingers and the little people chained up the unconscious wolf man. A van from the show pulled up and they bundled him into the back. I thought about demanding the wolf man's death, but what good would it have been? He wasn't evil. Just naturally mad. Killing him would have been pointless and cruel. 
When they'd finished with the wolfman, the little people's attention turned to Sam's shredded remains. Hold on, I said as they went to pick him up and cart him away. What are they going to do with Sam? Mr. Toll coughed uncomfortably. I, uh, rather imagine they intend to, uh, dispose of him, he said. It took me a moment to realize what that meant. They're going to eat him? I shrieked. We can't just leave him here, Mr. Toll reasoned, and we don't have time to bury him. This is the easiest. No, I said firmly. Darren, Mr. Crepsley said, we should not interfere with. No, I shouted, striding over to the little people, backwards. I shouted, striding over to shove the little people backwards. If they want to eat Sam, they'll have to eat me first. The little people stared at me wordlessly with hungry green eyes. I think they'd be quite happy to accommodate you, Mr. Toll said dryly. I mean it, I growled. I won't let them eat Sam. He deserves a proper burial. So that worms can devour him, Mr. Toll asked, then sighed when I glared at him and shook his head irritably. Let the boy have his way, Hibernius, Mr. Crepsley said softly. You may return to the sick with the others. I will stay and help dig the grave. Very well, Mr. Toll shrugged. He whistled and cocked a finger at the little people. They hesitated, then backed away and grouped around the owner of the Cirque de Freak, leaving me alone with the dead Sam Grest. Mr. Toll and his assistants left. Mr. Crepsley sat down beside me. How are you? he asked. I shook my head. There was no simple answer to that. Do you feel stronger? Yes, I said softly. Even though it had been long since I drank Sam's blood, I already noticed a difference. My eyesight had improved, as had my hearing, and my battered body didn't hurt nearly as much as it should. You will not have to drink again for a long time, he said. I don't care. I didn't do it for me. I did it for Sam. Are you angry with me? He asked. No, I sighed. Darren, he said. I hope. I don't want to talk about it, I snapped. I'm cold, sore, miserable, and lonely. I want to think about Sam, not waste words on you. As you wish, he said, and began digging the soil with his fingers. I dug beside him in silence for a few minutes, then paused and looked over. I'm a real vampire's assistant now, aren't I? I asked. He nodded sight. He nodded sadly. Yes, you are. Does that make you glad? No, he said. It makes me feel ashamed. As I stared at him, confused, a figure appeared above us. It was the little person with the limp. If you think you're taking Sam, I warned him, raising a dirt encrusted hand. Before I got any further, he jumped into the shadow hole stuck his wide, grey-skinned fingers into the soil and clawed up large clumps. He's helping us? I asked, puzzled. It seems like it, Mr. Crepsley said, and laid a hand on my back. Rest, he advised. We can dig faster by ourselves. I will call you when it's time to bury your friend. I saw a sense in that, nodded, crawled out, and lay down on the bank beside the quickly forming grave. After a while, I shuffled out of the way and sat, waiting in the shadows of the cold, old railway station. Just me and my thoughts, and Sam's dark red blood on my lips between my teeth. Chapter 34 We buried Sam without much ado. I couldn't think of anything fitting to say, and filled in the grave. We didn't camouflage it, so he'd be discovered by the police and given a real burial soon. I wanted his parents to be able to give him a proper send-off, but this would keep him safe from the scavenging animals and little people in the meantime. 
We broke camp before dawn. Mr. Tall told everybody there it was a long trek ahead. Sam's disappearance would create a fuss, so we had to get as far away from here as possible. I wondered as we set off what had become of RV. Had he bled to death in the forest? Had he made it to a doctor in time? Or was he still running and screaming, my hands, my hands? I didn't care. Although he'd been trying to do the right thing, this was RV's fault. If he hadn't gone messing with the logs in the wolfman's cage, Sam would be alive. I didn't hope RV was dead, but I didn't say a prayer for him either. I'd leave him to fate and whatever I had in store. Ever sat beside me at the rear of a van as the sick pulled out. He started to say something, but then stopped, cleared his throat. Then he placed a bag on my lap. I found that, he muttered. I thought you might want it. Those stinging, through stinging eyes, I read the name, Sam Grest, then burst into tears and wept bitterly over it. Everett put his arms around me and held me tight and cried along with me. Mr. Crapsley told me what happened, Everett mumbled eventually, recovering slightly and wiping his face clean. He said you drank Sam's blood to keep his spirit alive. Apparently, I replied weakly, unconvinced. Look, Everett said, I know how much you didn't want to drink human blood, but you did this for Sam. It was an act of goodness, not evil. You shouldn't be all bad for drinking from him. I guess, I said, then moaned at the memory and wept some more. The day grew old. The Cirque du Freak rolled on, but thoughts of Sam couldn't be left behind. As the night closed upon us, we pulled over to the side of the road for a short break. Everett went to look for food and refreshments. Can I get you anything? He asked. No, I said, my face pissed, my face pressed against the window pane. I'm not hungry. He started to leave. Hey, wait a sec. I called him back. There was a strange taste in my mouth. Sam's blood was still a hold on my lips, salty and terrible, but that wasn't what had set the buds of the back of my tongue tingling. There was something I wanted, which I had never wanted before. For a handful of confusing moments, I didn't know what it was. Then, I placed the strange craving and managed the thinnest of smiles. I searched Sam's bag but the jar must have been left behind when we broke camp. Looking up at Evra, I wiped tears from my eyes, licked my lips, and asked in a voice which sounded a lot like that of a curious, smart-ass kid I once knew. Do we have any pickled onions? To be continued. <laughs>